Hello everyone. Very good evening to all of you. So, myself, Dr. Devesh Mishra, and right now I am at Next Learning Center for Pathology Revision for those students who are going to write their FMG exam in June 2022. So, I have some sets of topic which I have framed as a MCQ, which I am going to discuss right now. So, I just wanted to, uh, you know, give some suggestions to those students who are going to write this exam on 4th of June. I will just say a few things. For example, what I am going to teach right now, these are all important topics which you should focus upon. Right? Not only the MCQs, you have to understand, not only the MCQs are important, these topics are important. So, keep revising these topics from your notes. And while going through the questionnaire, when I will be putting the question, I will be giving you a you know 30 second time to give your answer. So that time what you have to understand, language is very, very important. This is how question language will be changed and your answer will be changed. So that is the point you have to understand. You have to focus on the language of the question, language of the options and you have to read all the options very carefully. So let's start with the prayer that you all should have a great and grand success in every exams of your life. Those who want to connect with me on my YouTube also, you can see me this on my telegram also. So, you might be there. So, let's start without delay. This is the first question which was your previous year question also. Liquefactive necrosis is seen in. Now, I am waiting for the answer. Who is giving me the first correct answer? Liquefactive necrosis. Very good. Very nice. Very good. I, I have got nearly all correct answer for this question. See, liquefactive necrosis is a very important question in exam. And one should know that. There are two patterns of necrosis, we all know that, right? One is coagulative and one is liquefactive, right? Liquefactive necrosis and coagulative necrosis, what is the basic difference if you, if you know that? If you know that, if you see coagulative necrosis versus liquefactive necrosis, right? In coagulative necrosis, most important thing I am writing, tissue architecture will be preserved, right? So, I am just writing plus, plus means present, tissue architecture is not going to be lost. Right? That is the coagulative necrosis. But in liquefactive necrosis, this tissue architecture will be lost. Right? So, tissue architecture will be lost. So, usually coagulative necrosis is seen in those conditions where we find ischemia or infarction. Right? So, whenever there is a ischemic or infarction, damage is present in the tissue, you will see the coagulative necrosis. Whereas, Liquefactive necrosis, where you will see, you will see in the case of infections, right? And what will happen? Because of the infections, there will be toxins. And these toxins will be releasing enzyme. And that enzyme will be causing hydrolytic damage. And because of this hydrolytic change, there will be no tissue architecture. Now, you can understand why I am saying tissue architecture is lost. Because there is a hydrolytic change. And because of this hydrolytic change, we are going to see that, we are going to see that there is loss of architecture, right? So, where you will see that coagulative necrosis, so usually we will see this in solid organs, right? So, who are these solid organs? The question is, who are the solid organs present in our human body, right? So, now you can see that, what are the solid organs? Number one is heart, number two is lungs and number three is spleen. So, all these are solid organs, now you understand? So, heart, lung, spleen, they will have a coagulative necrosis. What is remaining? So, this is our answer. Brain will be having liquefactive necrosis. Right? So, brain will be having liquefactive necrosis. This is the point you have to understand. Right? Why brain will have a liquefactive necrosis? <laughs> because there is no stromal support. Right? No stromal support. And there are liquefactive enzymes which are present in the brain tissue. So, these are the two reasons why brain should have a liquefactive necrosis. So, answer is B. Liquefactive necrosis will be seen in 
brain right liquefactive necrosis will be seen in the brain tissue right fine so just few important points as i have told you already just go through this as i said coagulative necrosis is ischemic infarction of the solid organs right what are the solid organs heart kidney and spleen which is the most common solid organ heart is the most common solid organ liquefactive necrosis where you will see in brain infarction where there is no stromal support and why there is no stromal support because there is no collagen basically collagen forms this stroma but brain does not have collagen does not have collagen brain does not have collagen right so that is why there is no stromal support and moreover they are very rich in liquefactive enzymes and always remember if examiner talk about infections in infections you will find liquefactive necrosis so that is how you understand if examiner give you a image based question suppose examiner can give you a question like this ki uh, in this image which type of necrosis will be seen so what you are seeing in this image can you see this we are looking at the brain right and what is this tissue architecture is not present so what is this this is a example of liquefactive necrosis so that is how we will identify liquefactive necrosis now look at this this is the normal brain in normal brain you can see the architecture of brain tissue is preserved right architecture of brain tissue is preserved but when you are seeing the liquefactive necrosis of the brain now you cannot see the uh, you know these are the oligodendral cells and the astrocytes these are present here but here you can see nothing you are seeing just necrotic tissue that's all and these necrotic tissue there is no tissue architecture right so there is no tissue architecture preserved here so this will be a example of liquefactive necrosis so brain infarction liquefactive necrosis that is the answer right now coming to the next question so let's try for this question again a very important topic and it has so many things in 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 each and every discussion each and every option you will see many future questions or many pyq previous year question which had been asked in your exam right so now you can see 80 year old female has suffered with heart disease and cardiac atrophy right on microscopy there is a perinuclear perinuclear brown color deposits were seen which of the following pigment is responsible for thing so can you tell me which of the following because all these things are very closer options and i want to know that who is giving me the first correct answer very good i think i am seeing the first correct answer is given by many of you very nice very nice so who is giving me the first correct answer right so there are many many people who have given me the correct the first i have got it from the Uh, Alia Khan, very good. Alia, you have given me the correct answer. Yes, uh, Doctor K K is asking, can liquefactive necrosis too occur in solid organs if infection is the cause? Yes, very good. That's what you have to understand. Please, I am just coming back. If you see infection in any solid organ, please remember. If you find infections in any solid organ, for example, if examiner says that that heart is infected. right and which type of necrosis you will see so the infection word means this will go for liquefactive necrosis you have to be very careful for this language very good dr kk so now alia khan has given me the first correct answer for this question this question is little tricky question why i am saying this is a very tricky question because whenever you see the brown pigment in our human body try to understand what i am saying whenever you see brown pigment in our human body there are two things should come into your mind one the most common pigment is lipofuscin please remember what i am saying the word most common if no nothing has been mentioned right if examiner is asking which brown pigment is present so most common is lipofuscin but when nothing has been mentioned you have to be careful about what is the exact language of the question so lipofuscin and iron or hemosiderin whatever you can say is the important one right so lipofuscin or iron is important brown pigment so these are the two differentials right so right now i have written two differential diagnosis for brown pigment right so now how you will identify in this particular question 80 year old male right heart disease cardiac atrophy so what all these suggest that this is the common pigment common brown pigment which is seen in older individual older means 80 year old can you see this this patient is 80 year old right he is having heart disease cardiac atrophy right and perinuclear brown pigment so there is no mentioning of the you know special stain so our answer should be lipofuscin so in this question our answer should be lipofuscin right but my question is what will happen if examiner will add suppose examiner adds here ki uh, this was positive for pearls prussian blue staining 
understand pearls prussian blue staining then what will be the pigment then your answer will be iron pigment so now you understand what i, I want to say that see uh, what i want to say that whenever you see a brown pigment there are two differential diagnoses lipofuscin and iron pigment right how you will differentiate these so we will differentiate them on the basis of what special stain we are going to use for them right so lipo is having lipid can you see the name itself is telling lipid lipo means lipid so right? name itself is telling it is having lipid so whenever lipid is there so what special stain we are going to use what special stain so for lipid we are going to use oil red o stain right oil red o stain and sudon black b there are two stains which are used for lipid identification or fat identification right so special stain for fat or lipid is fat or lipid is oil red o stain or sudon black b and for iron what we are going to use for iron we are going to use pearls prussian blue stain pearls prussian blue stain right so now the question is how how you will identify the oil pigment or lipid pigment so lipid pigment will be red in color so see the name itself is telling if you are using oil red o it will be red in color so i'm just marking it can you see this oil red o red color will be color of lipid and sudan black b black color will be the color of lipid and pearls prussian blue blue color will be the color of iron pigment so now understand so if examiner says pearls prussian blue answer should be hemosiderin but here nothing has been mentioned so we will go with the most common and most common pigment is lipofuscin so answer should be lipofuscin right so please remember some important points about lipofuscin it is also known as aging pigment right it is also known as aging pigment <laughs> right <laughs> as i said the name of stain is also very frequently asked in exam so as i said for oil it is a oil red o and sudan black b for iron it is a pearls prussian blue what stain we are going to use for melanin can you tell me in the comment box melanin which stain will be used for melanin i want to know that who is giving me the first correct answer come on tell me fat fat melanin HM45 is a tumor marker. Yes, we can use Arman. You are correct. Uh, yes, Mason should be Fontana Mason. Very nice, very nice. Masana, Mason, Fontana, Hema is told me the correct thing. So for melanin, this was the question in our exam. So please remember, this stain is called as Fontana Mason. Stain is used for melanin. So please remember this. This can be also a future question in your exam because earlier it was a NB question, right? And calcium. can you tell me which stain you will use for calcium just one name that's all i want to know that i want to see who is giving me the first correct answer very nice very good alizarin von kosa very good very good rupesh and uh, very nice rupesh and rizwana right so calcium we have to use von kosa stain right von kosa stain and second stain is alizarin red alizarin red right so these are important points so whenever examiner ask you older individual perinuclear brown pigment this was the earlier question so you think about lipofuscin until and unless examiner says it is a pearls prussian blue positive right now you understand if examiner will say pearls prussian blue positive it means it is iron or hemosiderin right so just have a few uh, important things about this images which examiner may ask in your exam see what i am showing you here it is a liver biopsy right in this liver biopsy what we are seeing we are suppose i am showing you this particular cell right focus on this particular cell so in this particular cell i am showing you this is the nucleus right this is the nucleus and around the nucleus you can notice there is a brown pigment so this is the perinuclear brown pigment so now you understand this perinuclear brown pigment can be this can be a lipofuscin or hemosiderin also right so at this moment most commonly lipofuscin but it can be hemosiderin how we will confirm so now understand as i said ki this perinuclear brown pigment can be lipofuscin also versus iron also so how we are going to confirm we will confirm it by a special stain so what is special stain we are going to use now you can see that if we are using oil red o stain so now you can see all these red color areas are the oil or lipid so that is how oil or lipid will be appearing red right so remember this is a very important question oil red o stain is best to detect oil on frozen cell this is also very important mcq best for lipid detection on frozen section is 
oil red o stain so oil will be red in color right so in oil red o and this was again a very important question and remember it will be bright blue in color on pearls prussian blue staining so when you will see a uh, color of pigment perinuclear brown pigment is like this so these are blue color pigment and whenever you find blue color pigment this means these are the iron so that is how you are going to differentiate i understand this is how uh, uh, you know it will differentiate very good many of you are giving me a very uh, nucleus uh, <coughs> it depends on the stain right so need not to focus on the color of the stain whenever examiner will say that pearls prussian blue stain you will see brown brown pigment the main thing which you have to focus will become very very prominent like this but you can see here in this if you want to know the nucleus nucleus is looking red in color and a kk nucleus is red in color so you got the point kk now coming to the uh, next question which of the following is not true regarding aging i i want to warn you one thing here this is going to come in your exam try to listen to this discussion very importantly this topic this question many of the explanation you may get as a question in your in this exam right so be careful about this because this is one of the favorite topic of the nb at present right so now you tell me what should be the correct answer here question is which of the following is not true regarding aging aging right telomere shortening is associated with aging free radical damage theory is most widely accepted theory of aging serotonin prolongs life span by increasing metabolism calorie restriction will prolong life span so very good very nice i am seeing many of you have given correct answer that's great right so ritesh khandelwal has given me first correct answer very good ritesh and many of you have given so i think all of you have given me correct answer i'm very happy for that thing right see uh, one by one i will rule out and i will make you understand see telomere what is telomere it's a see whenever uh, you see a chromosome like this right whenever you see a chromosome like this basically chromosome should not fuse to each other in our cell right because in our one cell there are two chromosomes right so they will not fuse because of the presence of telomere at their end these are the short stretches of the dna right so what i am saying these are the short stretches of the dna dna stretch present at the end of chromosome right so at the end of chromosome they are present so they will they will prevent the fusion right they will prevent the fusion right and they will also divide when cell will divide they will also getting shorter so as cell is having division so remember with the cell division it will become short right so there will be a point where cell division will be at that stage where all the telomeres will be used up so when all the telomeres are used up what will happen now chromosome will have fusion and degradation right so this is a important thing so that's what you are going to notice so as i said what is happening telomere is a short stretch of the dna at the end of the chromosome second thing with every division they are getting shorter and shorter so there will be a point of time when all the telomeres will be over right and when the telomeres are over this protection is gone so this chromosome will fuse they will be degraded so there is no dna because dna is present on the chromosome and if all the dna has damaged so now cell is gone and this is aging so what i want to say that telomere shortening is associated with aging is a true statement correct statement right free radical damage <clears throat> free radical damage theory is most widely accepted a theory of the aging right that is a true statement right when you will get more free radical anybody <clears throat> can you can you tell me in the comment box when you will get more free radical whenever we are under stress right suppose uh, our exam is coming or i am also teaching i am also teaching here i am also having stress you are having more stress than me so whenever stress is more please remember there will be more free radical and wherever more free radical is there there will be more aging in a very simple manner you have to understand because free radical is going to cause damage of the chromosome cells and that is how it is going to promote <coughs> cellular aging right so that is the most widely accepted so please remember don't take stress of your exam please because 
it is going to happen in a positive way with you right so don't worry about that thing right so that you can decrease the free radical and decrease your aging also right so this second statement is also a true statement third statement sirtuin sirtuin prolong life span by increasing metabolism true or false third statement so many of you have given correct answer so this is a false statement why this is false statement this statement i will explain you with the fourth option calorie restriction will prolong life span so this is a true statement why it is true statement what it will do so i am just writing here when we talk about calorie restriction right will prolong life span how it will prolong life span because calorie restriction please remember this point because in this uh, neat exam because neat is same uh, you know body who is going to create your mcqs so many students have got this answer as a wrong because they have written ki if you reduce calorie by 30% it will prolong life span which is a which is a wrong statement if you reduce your calorie what will happen suppose i reduce my calorie so i will have a malnutrition with malnutrition i will have a shorter life span how i will survive Now understand. So decrease in calories not the right answer. Increase in our calories also not the right answer because if I will increase my calorie, I will have obesity, diabetes, hypertension. So what should be the correct answer? It should be proportionate amount. It should be balanced amount, and that balanced amount is called as calorie restriction. That is why you must look for this because in that question there was a statement that reducing stress, reducing stress. will reduce the aging now you understand what i want to say that it will increase the life span so that was the right answer whatever is going to reduce our stress aging will be reduced and life span will be prolonged so that is what i am saying calorie restriction means not reduction not increase appropriate amount whatever we require if we require 10 calorie 10 calorie only it should not be 9 it should not be 11 also so calorie restriction what they will do they will induce sirtuin and what sirtuin will do sirtuin will decrease the free radical damage sirtuin will decrease the overall metabolism please remember this is what we have to understand because this may confuse you in your exam overall metabolism why i am saying overall metabolism why i am saying overall metabolism because <laughs> because sirtuin has a one more tendency that it will activate insulin sensitivity so this will increase the insulin sensitivity and because of increased insulin sensitivity there will be increase in the only one metabolism which is glucose metabolism now you understand only glucose metabolism will be increased by them <laughs> overall that is why if you if you if you look at my language i said overall metabolism is getting decreased but when we talk about glucose metabolism it is getting increased because insulin sensitivity has been increased that is why sirtuin is now a days used as a research purpose they are using it to trying to treat the diabetes mellitus because diabetes is having problem with the glucose metabolism got the clear point so what should be the right answer for this question sirtuin is the prolonging life span definitely it prolong life span but it is not increasing metabolism because it is if it is generally written it is talking about overall metabolism right so just few words about uh, telomere just already i have told you telomere is present at the end of the chromosome it is short stretches of the dna telomere is present at the end of the chromosome and when they will divide they will be causing aging right So what is telomere? Progressively, it will shorten, and after each cell division, it will be getting shorter and shorter. And it, this will also prevent fusion and degradation. So as I said, after each and every cell division, when they are getting shorter, so they will lead to the aging also. So telomere shortening is associated with aging also, right? <coughs> calorie restriction. So as I said, appropriate amount of calorie should be there. It will increase life span by increasing the serotonin. This is number one. What future question examiner can ask from here? that which hormone signaling it will decrease and remember it is insulin growth factor hormone will be decreased because try to understand what is happening because insulin growth factor whenever they are high in the amount they will increase cell growth right if cell growth is more more replication means more shortening of the telomere 
and that is or that is what it is going to cause cell damage and cell aging so this is again a very important point if you can remember it is good but if you remember this much that is also fine right now coming to the uh, next question this is a simple uh, repeat question in our earlier exam which of the following is opsonin so tell me which is the correct answer which of the following is opsonin Right. So, here uh, I am getting correct answer by Gaura and uh, right. So, correct. First correct answer is given by Gaura. So, this is about opsonin. Opsonin means what? It will help in increasing phagocytosis, right? So, opsonin actually helps in increasing phagocytosis, right? How it will increase in phagocytosis? By coating it can coat any normal cell also or it can coat organism also right by coating organism or cell right so can you tell me in the comment box which is the best opsonin on this human body can you tell me which is the best opsonin right so, best opsonin is very good. So, if examiner asks you which is the best opsonin, so answer should be IgG is best opsonin. It is better than IgM, right? So, this is number one antibodies. So, we can say that antibodies are opsonin and amongst the antibodies, it will be IgG, right? Second, we can also see complement as a C3B, right? So, this was the question. So, this is the right answer. C3B is the best opsonin in this case, right? So, question is C3B. So, best opsonin is C3B. Can you tell me uh, what is E cadherin? What is E cadherin? It is an addition molecule. Selectin is also addition molecule. And PCAM1, this is important MCQ. Can you tell me? PCAM1 is also addition molecule and they are best for which process? Can you tell me in the comment box? PCAM1, right. PCAM1 is for which, which thing? Diapedesis or phagocytosis? Very good, very good. So, Vijaya Kumari has told me the first correct answer. So, PCAM1 is for, PCAM1 is for diapedesis. Right. So, PKM1 is for diapedesis. Right. So, now you understand opsonin is the complement C3B. Best opsonin is IgG. Right. If examiner is asking you these kind of questions. See, in exam time, you have to be a little focused during exam. When you are writing your exam, read all the options very carefully and do not get nervous if you are committing some mistake or you are not able to find out right answer in a, in a you know, in a consecutive. Sometimes what happened? First question you don't know. Second question you don't know. So, don't worry that time. In every exam, there will be 10 to 15 questions which will be tough. In your paper, it may be in, you know, in the first few questions. So, don't worry. First 20 minutes, solve those questions which, which you are damn confident, which you are very sure that this is the correct answer, right? So, C3B is the best option in. So, here what will be the future question? What will be the future question? Uh, what is the best option in overall? So, answer will be IgG if it is given in your option, right? Yes, PCAM1 is also known as CD31. If you want to know that, another name of PCAM1 is also known as CD31. Coming to the next question, all of the following are true about neutrophilic extracellular trap, except, see the language of the question, you have to read very carefully. You should not miss all these words, except, or which is incorrect, all these things examiner can keep, right? So, I want to see that who is giving me first correct answer for this question. Mm -hmm. So, Rajasekhar has given me first correct answer. See, uh, neutrophilic extracellular trap, if you look at the name, right, 
so if you look at the name uh, name itself is giving you some hint suppose i am showing you this is the neutrophil right and we all know that neutrophil is having wonderful multinucleated lobe right so that is the normal neutrophil where nucleus and chromatin and their dna or chromatin nuclear chromatin is inside the cell right but what happens when we are having infections or sepsis right so during infections or sepsis what will happen this chromatin will come outside so now you will see neutrophil is like this right so the cell is like this but chromatin is coming outside like this right so why this nuclear chromatin is coming outside so that it can inactivate the antigen which is outside so this will inactivate the antigen outside right so this is going to inactivate antigen outside right so first option if you look at this form during sepsis so can you tell me is it true or false all of the following are true about neutrophilic extracellular trap right so now you can see that all the chromatin has come outside so this is called as neutrophilic extracellular trap because it is going to trap the antigen which is outside that is why name is neutrophilic extracellular trap right so these had been formed in infection and sepsis so first statement will be a true statement right so first statement is a true statement associated with bacterial infection so it can be any infection not only bacterial it can be any infection so this is also a true statement right so b is also true statement it is made up of mitochondrial dna is it is it mitochondrial dna do you think that is it a mitochondrial dna do you think that is it is it a mitochondrial dna yes or no so it's not mitochondrial dna it is a simple nuclear dna it is not mitochondrial dna mitochondria is in cytoplasm right it is a nuclear dna right so here we have to understand this is not a mitochondrial dna so this is a false statement right so this is a false statement and our correct answer right so this is not made up of mitochondrial dna right it is a chromatin with antibacterial enzyme so that is also a true statement of neutrophilic extracellular trap so this is the point you have to remember right neutrophilic extracellular trap they will inactivate antigen and mostly they are mostly they are or their most common function is antimicrobial function this was the earlier question in exam antimicrobial in function so their common function is the antimicrobial right so this is the point you have to remember right look at this picture of the uh, diagram examiner can ask you questions so just i am showing you the image which is given in robins right so can you tell me i am marking this tell me what is number 1 what is number 2 and what is number 3 and what is number 4 so i have written uh, four areas four cells right this is actually immunofluorescence stain right where we are seeing neutrophil right normally uh, neutrophil will be having i will tell you later on you tell me in the comment box which one is net in this in, in immunofluorescence stain can you tell me who are the neutrophilic extracellular trap and where you are seeing the normal neutrophil right like that examiner can mark and he can ask you question right so what should be right answer here right number 1 very good number 1 what are we are seeing here is is a neutrophilic extracellular trap t uh, what happens in a normal neutrophil in a normal number 2 is a normal neutrophil this is the normal neutrophil normal neutrophil you will see green color is the cytoplasm and this orange color is the nucleus right so can you can you see here where is the nucleus in this neutrophil are you seeing nucleus here no it's all dark color because nucleus has come outside so this one is the neutrophilic extracellular trap so whatever we are seeing here this is the neutrophilic extracellular trap but number 2 is normal number 3 also you can see here all the nuclear chromatin is outside so this is the all the nuclear chromatin so this is neutrophilic extracellular trap so number 3 is also a neutrophilic extracellular trap and number 4 is a normal neutrophil so now you understand who are the net they are number 1 and number 3 and who are the normal nucleus normal neutrophil number 2 and number 4 so that is how you are going to identify neutrophilic extracellular trap so now in this process when chromatin has been you know thrown away 
So what will be the fate of the neutrophil? After NAT formation, they will be dead. And this is called as beneficial suicide. So please remember, NAT is also called as beneficial suicide. Right. So these are important point about the neutrophilic extracellular tract. Right. Now coming to the next question, this is again a very important MCQ uh, for our exam. It's a repeat question only. Stellate granulomas are seen in which condition? Stellate granulomas are seen in which condition? I want to see who is giving me the first correct answer. Very nice. Nearly all are giving me correct answers. Who is the first one? I am searching now. Right. So, many of you have given me correct answers. So, simultaneously so many answers are coming. So, it is difficult to no, but that's great. I have seen so many of you are giving correct answers. Stellate granuloma is a special type of granulomas. First of all, we should remember that stellate granuloma is a special type of granuloma. Right? This is a special type of granuloma. Why it is a special? Why it is a special? Because it contains neutrophil. Right? They contain neutrophil or neutrophilic abscess because granuloma is a pattern of chronic inflammation. Right? So, chronic inflammation should not be having neutrophil, but this is something special where neutrophil is present. So, that is why this is a special type of granuloma and sometimes it is also written as a stellate abscess, right? It will be written as a stellate abscess and this will be seen in cat scratch disease, right? So, stellate abscess will be seen in cat scratch disease, right? So, that is the right answer for this question. Can you tell me which you, uh, what is the name of granuloma you see in sarcoidosis? Don't tell me non caseous granuloma because already you know that. There is a one name. Can you tell me what is the name of this sarcoidosis granuloma? Naked granuloma. Very good. Uh, Afzal has given me first correct answer. Afzal and Reshu has given me, right? So, sarcoidosis non caseating granuloma is called as naked granuloma so this is another important question which examiner ask in exam naked granuloma is seen in sarcoidosis right tuberculosis can you tell me in the comment box in tb will you find caseous non caseous or both i want to answer correct answer caseous non caseous or both in tuberculosis tell me I am waiting that who is giving me first correct answer, first correct answer, it is a very good question. TB is having caseating, non-caseating, both of the above. What should be right answer? Very nice, very nice. So, I have got first correct answer from the Pragya. Very good Pragya. So, TB always remember they will be having, they will be having caseating granuloma also which is more common, but remember they can also have non-caseating granuloma. So, that is the point you have to remember because many guidebooks they say only caseating. Caseating is most common and characteristic, but non-caseating granuloma can be also seen in tuberculosis. Uh, cerebral malaria is again very important question. Which type of granuloma you will see in cerebral malaria? What is that name? Cerebral malaria. Some student have written that. Very good. So, cerebral malaria will be seen in Cerebral malaria will be uh, called as naked, uh, they will be called as Dirk's granuloma, not naked. They will be called as Dirk's granuloma, right. So, this is the Dirk's granuloma, right. So, Dirk's granuloma will be seen in cerebral malaria caused by plasmodium falciparum, right, caused by plasmodium falciparum, right. So, now you understand. Stellate granuloma is also known as stellate abscess. They will have a neutrophil. They are seen in cat scratch disease. Important point to note, sarcoidosis will have a naked granuloma. TB will be having both type of granuloma, caseating, non-caseating, but most common and characteristic is caseating granuloma. And cerebral malaria will be having dust granuloma, which is seen in plasmodium falciparum. Where it will be seen? It will be seen in the brain only. Please remember, sometime examiner says it will be seen in liver also. So that is why I am writing only brain. 
only brain will be having this cerebral malaria, right? So, you have to remember these important points. Now, coming to the next question, this is a previous year question in your exam. Uh, these are all actually PYQs only, right? So, only you have to focus on the discussion, right? And from the discussion, you are going to get the question in your exam. <laughs> so, tell me what is the right answer? Surgical incision was made on the patient's chest and after some time, he comes to show the scar and now you can see scar is shown here. So, what are these scars? Hypertrophic scar, keloid or is it a basal cell carcinoma or abscess? See, uh, many of you are telling that keloid is more darker. It's not like that. It's not like that. You have to see the nature of the scar here. The scar is a scar is only on the one area. Suppose what would happen? Probably uh, this was the area where incision would have been given. Right? I'm just writing here. So scar should be present only up area. Right? But scar is spreading from the original incision. That this is the area where incision was given. Right. So, if scar limited up to this area only, this would have called as hypertrophic scar. Right. This would have called as hypertrophic scar. When a scar is limited to the area of the incision. But in this case, what we are seeing that a scar has come here also, here also, it is a widespread scarring. Right. So, widespread scarring when we are seeing like this. So, this is a keloid. It is, it is not related to color and all. So, do not think that key, it is darker colored. So, it is a keloid scar. So, our answer should be B. Right? It is a keloid scar. It is not hypertrophic scar. Right? So, basal cell carcinoma will not be like this. Abscess will be having some different pattern. Right? And that is not the abscess and it is not a hypertrophic scar. So, this is the point we have to remember. Right? Now, I will just brief you few points about the hypertrophic scar and keloid. So, what is hypertrophic scar? Scarring will be limited to the original wound, right? So, if you see uh, what I have said, ki it is limited to this area only where original incision was given. So, this will be called as hypertrophic scar, right? But in keloid, scar tissue is beyond the boundaries of original wound, right? Scar tissue will be having beyond the boundaries of the original wound, right? So, that is what we are seeing in this picture, beyond the boundaries. Where you will see the keloid, right? It will be seen on sternum right and they are commonly seen in african origin or black black origin you can say that right so genetically they are having association most common site is on the sternum and most important point is no spontaneous regression will be there so keloid is beyond the boundaries no spontaneous regression they have genetic association and commonly seen in the african origin or you can say black color skin like we people and most common site will be on a sternum, which we are seeing in this question also. This is the most common site of the scar. And see, the, the color of the person is also black, right? So, that is how we have to remember. Hypertrophic scar, as I said, scarring will be limited to the original wound. And this may regress spontaneously also. And they will have no genetic association. So, there will be no genetic association. There is no, uh, you know, location, specific location. And they will regress spontaneously. So, we need not to worry about the patient who is coming with the hypertrophic scar, right? So, keloid scar is the problem. Because whenever you are going to give the surgical treatment or, you know, incision or any kind of, you know, steroidal treatment, you have to tell to your patient that this is not going to get treated forever. It is going to have a recurrence. You have to come again and again for the problem, right? Uh, Nadim, actually, uh, surgeon should uh, discuss about the. I am a pathologist. I can treat. I can only discuss about the pathology, right? So please try to understand, right? So now you can see these are the two images which you have to remember. This image already I have shown you. What is this? This is the picture of keloid. Most common site is the sternum. Right? And what is this? This is the picture of hypertrophic scar. So, can you tell me uh, one statement about the scar? What these scars will be having? Can you tell me? Which collagen will be present in this scar? Can you tell me? In granulation tissue, which collagen is present? This is a very important MCQ. That is why I am asking. Granulation tissue, uh, which type of collagen will be present? And scar tissue, which type of collagen will be present? Very good. Granulation tissue, collagen 3 will be present. So, please remember collagen type 3 is present in the granulation tissue. It is a very, very important MCQ. Scar tissue, you will be having the type 1 collagen. 
right so type 1 collagen is present in the scar tissue right so that is how we have to understand now coming to the next question which of the following is autosomal recessive inheritance autosomal recessive inheritance it's a very simple question right and you need not to mug up everything for autosomal recessive right you just focus on those questions which are important and frequently asked in exams Very good. So, I can see many of you are giving correct answer. Very good. Who is the one? Firdosh, Anupam. No, Anupam. It is not D. Yes, it is A. Yes. So, it is autosomal recessive. This is a very basic question came in this neat PG also. So, examiner can ask question like this. Cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive disorder. Huntington chorea is an example of autosomal dominant Achondroplasia was a question in two years back. It was FMG previous year question only, right? So, this is the autosomal dominant. G6PD deficiency anemia is a very frequently asked question. I, I, I can assure you, you may get question something from here in your exam. G6PD anemia, you mark it. You may get the question and usually they ask which gender it is more common? Which gender it is most common if it is X-link recessive? Can you tell me? Which gender it is more common if it is X-link recessive? Don't worry. You have to remember those who are important topics, right? They will not ask you that big, big mnemonics, right? So, nothing to worry about that thing, right? So, now you have to understand, yes, X-link recessive is commonly seen in males. So, most commonly males are affected in G6PD deficiency anemia, right? Because this question had been asked in this NEET PG also, examiner can ask you, in G6PD deficiency, which pathway will be affected, right? So, it's a little bit biochemistry type of question. So, it will be affecting HMP pathway. So, that is the question we have to remember. HMP pathway will be affected by G6PD deficiency, right? So, HMP pathway, this was the question in this need. So, examiner can ask you, repeat this question to your exam also, right? Now, coming to the right answer, as I said, it is a cystic fibrosis. There are some questions which came in our previous year FMG exam. What are other autosomal recessive disorder which you should remember? There are two anemias. Please remember sickle cell anemia and thalassemia right sickle cell anemia and thalassemia these are the two important anemias which you should remember both are autosomal recessive and this was our previous year question sickle cell anemia was previous year question sickle cell anemia is example of <coughs> autosomal recessive disorder right so coming to the next question this was again a you know previous year question in your exam look at the image and give your diagnosis so this is a genetic disorder i will give you hint and now you have to tell me if you look at this image, look at this image and now you tell me what should be this syndrome. Right. So, Vagish has given me the first correct answer. Very good, Vagish. Uh, and, and all of you are giving me correct answer, right? Hariharan, Shubham, right? Imanshu, Arnold, very good. So, these are very good, very good. Uh, this is a Turner syndrome because what we are seeing here, what we are seeing here in this picture, this is a very good picture of the webbing of the neck. So, what I am showing you here is the webbing of the neck. Can you tell me what is this finding? Anybody in the comment box? Low posterior hairline. Very good, Alia Khan has told me. Uh, low posterior hairline. Very good, Alia. Low posterior hairline is present. Can you tell me what is the this finding in this image here? If you focus, <clears throat> very good, very good. Uh, I am seeing Rohan's, very good Rohan. Uh, it is a fourth sh short metacarpal, not finger, fourth short metacarpal. So, short fourth metacarpal. This was the earlier question in exam, right? Short fourth metacarpal is seen in which syndrome? Right. So, now answer is Turner syndrome. So, we all know that answer should be Turner syndrome where we are going to see short fourth metacarpal. Right. So, webbing of the neck, low posterior hairline, short fourth metacarpal. These are all features of the 
Turner syndrome, right? Short for metacarpal, please remember, sometime examiner asks this question, right? So, now you tell me, what is the karyotyping of Turner syndrome? Can you tell me? What is the karyotyping of Turner syndrome? Very good, Vagish. Uh, 45 X O, right? So, this is 45 X O, right? What is the karyotyping of the Down syndrome? Down syndrome? Is it a sex link or autosomal disorder? Very good, very good. I have seen all of you are giving correct answer. Priyani, Garima, Abhijit. Very good, Abhijit. It is a trisomy 21. Down syndrome is trisomy 21. Right? So, Down syndrome is trisomy 21. Right? What is Kleinfelter syndrome? This will be having X, X, Y. So, extra X chromosome will be present, right? So, that is how you will remember the Kleinfelter syndrome, right? Can you tell me uh, one thing? What is the difference between Turner syndrome? Who will be, matla, morphologically, with phenotypically, Turner syndrome will be female or male? Turner syndrome will be male or female? Can you tell me? Turner syndrome is male or female? Very good, very good, Vagish and Satakumar. Turner syndrome is commonly female and they will be presenting with the infertility, right? Presenting with the infertility or aminorrhea, right? Infertility or aminorrhea. Same way, examiner will ask you, Kleinfelter syndrome is phenotypically male or female? Understand, Kleinfelter syndrome is male or female? Very good, Salman, Shiva, very good. Uh, this is mostly male and they will be presenting with testicular atrophy, right? So, testicular atrophy will be their basic presentation in the Kleinfelter syndrome, right? What is Cryduchet syndrome? Can you tell me? Why this is Cryduchet syndrome? When this baby will cry, he will cry like a cat-like cat cry, right? Cat-like cry will be there. Cat like cry will be there. So, that is why this name is cry do chat syndrome. What is cry do chat syndrome? Which deletion is present here? Very good, very good, Hema Sau, uh, very good, uh, serotonin, very nice. Right. So, cry do chat syndrome is a chromosome number 5q minus. Minus means deletion, right. So, minus means deletion. Now you tell me if all these options are given in front of you, I am asking you one question. In which of them you will see partial monosomy? Can you tell me partial monosomy is seen in which of them? Partial monosomy. Very good, very good Vijiraj. Vijiraj has given me the correct answer, Cryduchat syndrome will be having partial monosomy. This was the question this time in NEET PG and examiner can ask in your exam also. Partial monosomy will be seen in cry do chat syndrome. Partial monosomy means suppose uh, one chromosome, this is the long arm and this is the short arm, right? <coughs> what will happen? Short arm will be having little bit of deletion like this. So, when there is a, there is a partial loss of the chromosome, right? Partial loss of the chromosome, this will be called as partial monosomy, right? So, please remember partial monosomy will be seen in cry do chat syndrome. So, these are the important point. Turner syndrome, uh, just I am showing you some of the things which I have already shown you, webbing of neck, important feature which we are seeing extra skin folds are present. When you are seeing the posterior neck, it will be having low posterior hairline and they will be having broad chest and widely spaced nipples, right? So, if this lady is coming to the OPD, what will be the characteristic thing which you will observe when she is standing at the door itself? Can you tell me in the comment box that patient has come and you are seeing and you can immediately observe that this lady may be a case of Turner syndrome by seeing height of the patient, right? So, if they will be having short stature. So, this is a very important point we have to remember. They will be having short stature. Right. So, short stature will be present in this female. Right. So, short stature female with amenorrhea. Yes, very good. Uh, and this is cubitus valgus. You can see normally it will be like this. 
but now you can see the forearm is getting deviated. So this is called increased angle or cubitus valgus. So cubitus valgus is present in the Turner syndrome. As I have told you in that image, that short fourth metacarpal is present. So now you can see that in the X-ray, you can notice here the metacarpal is short here. So one, two, three, fourth. So this one is the short fourth metacarpal, which you can see in radiologically, it is corresponding to this area. And as a result, this, this finger is quite smaller and nearly equal to the size of little finger, right? So that is how you will uh, identify when a patient is coming in front of you and she is sitting. So you can see that the third finger or fourth finger is having a smaller one because of this smaller fourth metacarpal. So this was the question in exam, short fourth metacarpal is seen in Turner syndrome, right? Now coming to the next question, uh, this is again a previous year question. Uh, patient was planned for transplantation. He has a uh, he has a twin brother who is matched donor for him. What is this type of graft? If the twin brother is a donor, right? So Alia Khan uh, Ovia has given me the correct answer. Uh, it is a isograft, right? So Vagish. Alia and all these have given me the correct answer. So this twin brother is giving it is whenever graft is taken from the twin, it is called isograft. Allograft means allograft means within the species, same species people are there, right? Same species. The species is same, but different individual, right? But individual will be different. That will be allo. Allo means different. Allo means different. Different one, right? So that is what you have to remember. Right, autograft means self, means suppose you are taking uh, skin area from here and implanting on my uh, cheek area. So that is the same, right? So from the same individual, same individual, you are taking the graft is called as autograft. Xeno means species. So it is graft taken from the different species that will be called as xenograft, right? So here I will, I will, uh, I have written all these things. So again, I will sum up. Autograft is from the self. Isograft, which I have written, we have to remember this another name. Isograft is also known as syngenic graft, right? It is from the identical twin, right? Allograft, allograft is from the non-identical twin of the same species, right? Xenograft, as I told, I told you, xeno means species and that is the different species, right? So that is the xenograft. Look at this diagram, which will be helping you to remember, uh, you know, most importantly, right? So what we can see here uh, in autograft, Right, it is from this self. See, both are same color, same. So these are twins, identical twins, or you can say twins also. So amongst the twin, it will be called as isograft. Right, so amongst the twin, isograft. So I'm just marking when there is a graft between the twins, it is isograft or syngenic graft. Right, when it is from this self, from this individual, we have taken the graft and implanted here. So that is the autograft. When it is from the same species, but you can see the color are different, right? They are not brother. They are different people, right? But from the same human being. So this is same species, so called as allograft, right? Same species, allograft. Now you can see here, there is a beautiful pic. So if it is from the animal to the human being, that will be different species and that will be called as xenograft. So that is xenograft, which we are seeing in this type of transplant, right? Mother to son will be allograft. Mother to son will be allograft. Right? Mother to son will be allograft. Who is this? Curious, right? Now, coming to the next question. This is a very good question. It, uh, similar question had been asked in your exam. So, I have just made make it little difficult for you. But examiner can ask you many things from here. Which of the following is true about this renal biopsy of diabetes mellitus patient? Renal biopsy of diabetes mellitus patient. Hypertension is most common presentation in this patient. Uh, beta 2 microglobulin is commonly seen in such patient. It is a type 1. It is seen in type 2 DM. So what is this? Can you tell me in the comment box? Mm -hmm. I did not get any correct answer for this till now. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you so much. Uh, 
uh, uh, yes Jamal has given me first correct answer okay great so very nice uh, see uh, this question if you look at this what I am writing here can you see the comment can you see the language of the question it is a renal biopsy so what I am showing you it is a renal biopsy right so that one thing is clear renal biopsy and what I am talking about if you look at this picture can you tell me what is the name of this stain can you tell me what is the name of this uh, stain which examiner asked in exam which was the previous year question identify this stain so what is this stain this is congo red staining congo red staining and congo red staining under which light under polarized microscopy or under polarized light polarized light means polarized microscopy that is the name of microscopy right so we are seeing congo red so in congo red what we are observing what we are observing what are the appearance of these things these are looking like a can you tell me in the comment box very nice apple green very good m you have shown apple also green color so this is a apple green by refringence apple green by refringence so if you are seeing apple green by refringence so what it suggests can you tell me what it suggests what is your diagnosis now if I am showing you a, 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 kid, a kidney biopsy, renal biopsy, apple green is positive. Haan, aapko PDF milega, PDF milega, Sumit, sabko PDF milega, PDF will be given to from the NLC also, in my group also it will be posted, right. Very good, amyloidosis, whenever we see apple green by reference, that will confirm the diagnosis of amyloidosis. So, this will confirm the diagnosis of amyloidosis so now we have got the idea right now we are talking about renal amyloidosis right now look at the option one by one that is how your approach should be in your exam right when you see this it's a kidney and when we are seeing a congo red staining and we we understand that is a renal amyloidosis what is the most common presentation in the renal amyloidosis can you tell me is it hypertension or nephrotic syndrome or massive proteinuria first statement is a wrong statement it is a false statement because hypertension is not most common. What is most common presentation? Massive proteinuria or nephrotic syndrome. Massive proteinuria or this is also called as nephrotic syndrome. Massive proteinuria or nephrotic syndrome is the most common presentation of the renal amyloidosis. Right? So, right now we are talking about renal amyloidosis. Our diagnosis is renal amyloidosis. Our diagnosis is renal amyloidosis, right? So, right now we are talking about renal amyloidosis and most common presentation of the renal amyloidosis is massive proteinuria or nephrotic syndrome. Many of you have given A beta 2 microglobulin. Can you, can you see the history here? Can you see the history here? Had I said this patient was on hemodialysis? Had I said like this in the question? No way, right? It's not hemodialysis. Beta 2 microglobulin is commonly seen in this patient is not right answer. It is a false statement. Where you will see beta 2 hemo, uh, microhemoglobin? See this beta 2 microglobulin, this amyloid, right? Beta 2 microglobulin amyloid you will find in only hemodialysis, not here. So please mark this. These are all important MCQ. Hemodialysis associated amyloidosis you will have. A beta 2 microglobulin. This is not the, no, where I am saying hemodialysis. Why you are assuming every kidney has a hemodialysis? No, it is not hemodialysis. If not hemodialysis not given, you should not go. Very good, Alia, you have said correctly. Hemodialysis will be having A beta 2 microglobulin. That is the point you have to remember. It is seen now, these two options are the question which had been asked very frequently in NBE exams, right? Type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes? See, type 1 diabetes, see, it is a conceptual question. Type 1 diabetes, what is happening? Inflammatory cells are damaging both the islet cells. So, islet cells are getting damaged. So, there is no place for amyloid to get deposit. So, type 1 diabetes, it will be not seen. So, it is a false statement. Now, understand because type 1 diabetes, see, amyloid deposition requires some cell. Between the cell only they will deposit. Now, within the cell, they do not deposit. Extracellular, acellular, so outside the cell. So, where when there is a Islet cells are preserved in those diabetes patients, but they are resistant to the insulin. Islet cells should be present and that will be the type 2 diabetes. So, this is the correct answer. So, this is the true statement. So, please remember examiner will ask you which type of amyloid will be present in diabetes and only type 2 diabetes will be having amyloidosis and this is called as AIAPP. 
आईलेट सेल एसोसिएटेड पॉलीपेप्टाइड अमाइलाइडोसिस राइट सो आई ए पी पी इज आईलेट आईलेट ए फॉर एसोसिएटेड पी पी इज पॉली पेप्टाइड सो आईलेट सेल एसोसिएटेड पॉली पेप्टाइड दिस इज द एमिलाइडोसिस विच विल बी सीन इन द पैंक्रियाज ऑफ द टाइप टू डायबिटीज ओनली this is a very very important if examiner says aipp type of amyloidosis will be seen in type 1 diabetes type 2 diabetes both answer is not both only type 2 diabetes will be having this one not in type 1 diabetes so this is a discriminating feature between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes type 1 diabetes no amyloidosis type 2 diabetes amyloidosis and what is that aipp type of amyloidosis now coming to the point can you tell me what is this staining anybody what i am marking now right now what is this staining these are the these are the kidney uh, glomerular capillaries right and this is the amyloid deposition no doubt this is the amyloid deposition only right amyloid only extracellular acellular pink amorphous amorphous means no morphology right so <laughs> can you tell me which staining it is i wanted to know that no it is not kimmel wilston lesion it is not kimmel wilston lesion but yes kimmel wilston will be also seen like this only it can be kimmel wilston it can be they will be also having this type of presentation but it is not kimmel wilston right now right this is not i am asking about stain this stain is not kimmel wilston stain kimmel wilston is the name of disease right this is a congoid staining only simple it's a congoid staining are you getting confused congoid staining this is also congoid staining sir is telling this is also congoid staining now you are telling this is also congoid staining what is the difference difference is this is a polarized light and this is the light microscopy now got the point this is the very very important point you have to remember see this next slide whenever you find congoid staining try to understand the language this is how examiner will deceive you this was the question in our exam 2 years back right congoid staining when examiner is going to write you have to focus on what language examiner is using ordinary light or polarized light ordinary light means light microscopy polarized light means polarized microscopy ordinary light what will be color it will be red or pink in color so they are red or pink in color now the question is is it diagnostic of amyloidosis so if examiner says if examiner says congo red staining under ordinary light or light microscopy is it diagnostic of amyloid deposition so answer should be it is not diagnostic why it is not diagnostic because it can be amyloid also it can be hyaline also it can be fibrin also it can be collagen so these are the differentials for the red pink color on ordinary light with congoid staining so that is why congoid staining will confirm the diagnosis only when we are using polarized light right polarized light you will see apple green by refringence so when you will see apple like right? apple like green by refringence that will be diagnostic of amyloidosis so this will be diagnostic of amyloidosis this is the point you have to remember so again i will show you this picture so now you can see uh, this is how uh, you have to identify in your exam it is a congoid staining pink or red color material so these pink or red color material these are amyloid right these are the amyloid which we are seeing in this picture right and when you see apple green by refringence can you see this apple green by refringence this will confirm the diagnosis of amyloidosis right so this will confirm the diagnosis of amyloidosis right so that is how you have to understand ki if it is a if it is a light microscopy it is non diagnostic right so this is non diagnostic because it can be any other thing also it can be hyaline it can be fibrin it can be collagen but to confirm the diagnosis it should be apple green by refringence right now coming to the next question which of the following is seen in a patient with zero derma pigmentosa previous year question now you tell me what is the correct answer dna helicase defect nucleotide excision repair defect or homologous recombination or dna mismatch repair what should be diagnosis what should be right answer kush dilpal singh and manish goswami these are the first few answers which are correct and after that also everybody is giving me correct answer except for the few people right 
I think everybody has given me for this question. I should not say few people, right? That's great. So all of you are giving me correct answer. Which of the following is seen in a patient with a xeroderma pigmentosa? So can you tell me, uh, first of all, we should know that. What is xeroderma pigmentosa? Can you tell me? Which means it is related to which condition? Which habit? UV light exposure? UV light exposure? Especially UVB, right? So, what UVB will cause? Skin cancer, right? Skin cancer will be caused by them, right? So, why there is a skin cancer? Because there is a defect in nucleotide excision repair. See what happens whenever UV light falls on our skin. Try to understand this point. Whenever UV light falls on our skin, they will be forming pyrimidine dimer. This is again a very important MCQ. That is why I am writing. This pyrimidine dimer is responsible for causing skin cancer. So that is the question in exam. What will cause skin cancer in zero derma pigmentosa or UV light exposure? So it is pyrimidine dimer which can cause skin cancer. So that was the question in exam. Pyrimidine dimer. So what will happen? Normal individual. When we will see a normal individual, there is a gene called as nucleotide excision repair gene. Right? Can you see this name? Nucleotide excision repair gene. So, this nucleotide excision repair gene will cut it down and remove them. Right? So, as a result, what will happen? This individual will remain normal. Got the point? But when there is a nucleotide excision repair gene defect is present. This will cause accumulation of more pyrimidine dimer and this will cause skin cancer. That's the point, right? So what is the right answer here? B is the right answer. Nucleotide excision repair defect will be present in the xeroderma pigmentosa. <coughs> I'm just asking you one question out of the way. Can you tell me which is the most common skin cancer? This was the question in your exam. That is why I'm asking. Most common skin cancer, can you tell me? Squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell, can you tell me? Squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma, which is most common skin malignancy? Tell me quickly. Which is most common? Squamous or basal cell? So, most commonly it is squamous cell or basal cell. So, answer is basal cell carcinoma. Please remember squamous is not most common. Right? So, here you should not commit mistake. It is the basal cell carcinoma of skin which is most common in our skin malignancy. Right? Now, we will see one by one what are the other things examiner can ask from here. DNA helicase defect. Can you tell me what disorder you will see if there is a DNA helicase is defective? DNA helicase. It will cause premature aging can you tell me the name of premature aging disorder which examiner asked in exam anybody premature aging premature aging it is progeria right so progeria syndrome or progeria so premature aging is because of dna helicase defect homologous dna repair defect is seen in which disorder that was also question in exam can you tell me homologous repair defect will be seen in which condition? Homologous repair defect. Homologous repair defect will be seen in number one, it can be seen in Fanconi's anemia. It can be also seen in Bloom syndrome. Right? So, Fanconi's anemia and Bloom syndrome and one more disorder you can add that is ataxia telangiectasia. Ataxia telangiectasia. These are all having homologous recombination repair defect. So, this is the point we have to remember. Homologous recombination repair defect will be seen in
you got the point so can you tell me the last one dna mismatch repair defect this was again a question in exam right dna mismatch repair defect will be seen in mismatch repair gene defect will be seen in which cancer can you tell me three names of the cancer which examiner ask in exam three names mismatch repair gene defect three cancers are there right very good so number one is hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer it means colorectal cancer first this is also uh, associated with stomach cancer and remember the new thing which examiner had asked in exam recently was the breast cancer so in breast cancer also you will find defect in the mismatch repair gene right so colon cancer stomach cancer breast cancer these are all having dna mismatch repair defect so i will repeat all these things once in a go dna helicase defect will be seen in a progeria or premature aging nucleotide excision repair defect is seen in xeroderma pigmentosa which is the right answer for this question homologous recombination repair defect is seen in fanconi's bloom syndrome and ataxia syndrome right and dna mismatch repair gene defect will be seen in hnpcc stomach cancer and breast cancer so these are the important point you have to remember right now coming to the next question this is again a very important topic and i can assure you you are going to get question from here from the human papilloma virus which of the following strain is most commonly associated with cervical cancer every exam they are asking and these are the repeat question from your last three years all fmg exam they are asking one or two question from this topic so tell me what is the right answer Right. So, Mudit Kumar has given me first correct answer. Very nice. So, I think those who are writing C as an answer is the correct answer. So, tell me uh, one thing in here, this, as I told you, C is the correct answer. So, let us talk about some more important point about this. Can you tell me who is causing tumor? Out of this A, B, C, D, who will be causing the tumor? A, B, C or D or all four. Who will be causing tumor? Who will be causing tumor? Tumor, tumor. Who will be causing tumor? Tumor. Because here many students they commit. Please remember, all four will be causing tumor. All four will be causing tumor. All four. It is not CD. All four. Because try to understand like this: HPV six and eleven will be causing benign. Papilloma. This was the question in our exam in 2020. Benign papilloma is caused by HPV 6 and HPV 11, right? And HPV 16 and 18 is causing squamous cell cancer or carcinoma, right? So that is the point you have to remember. Both are causing tumor. One is benign, one is malignant. When examiner says who is causing cancer? Then you have to think about HPV 16 and 18 and who is most commonly causing? So, HPV 16 is the most common cause of squamous cell carcinoma, right? So, answer should be HPV 16. So, please remember benign papilloma is caused by 6 and 11. This was the earlier question in exam, right? Now, uh, we can speculate one more question here because human papilloma virus, they have two genes, right? Can you tell me what are those two genes? Which examiner can ask you? I am just writing E. What are those two genes? E6 and E7. Right? E6 and E7. So, these are two things. Right? And their basic function is to inactivate certain genes in our human body. So, they will inactivate which gene? Can you tell me which will be inactivated by E6 and E7? Which will be inactivated by E6 and E7? E6 will inactivate. Can you tell me what is half of 6? Yes, very good. Very good. Uh, Mandar Pawar has given me correct answer. And Ritesh Khandelwal. Very good, Ritesh. Uh, many of you have given correct answer. E6, half of 6 is 3. So, it will be P53. Like that we can remember. Like that. This is a mnemonic, right? If you see 6, half of 6 is 3. So, E6 will inactivate. E6 will inactivate P53, right? And E7 will inactivate retinoblastoma gene. So, this is how they will be causing cancer, right? So, these are both tumor suppressor genes which will be inactivated by them, right? So, that was the question in exam. That is why you have to remember E7 will inactivate retinoblastoma 
and E6 will inactivate P53 gene, right? So these are the important point about human papilloma virus. Now this is again a very important question which came in our exam previous year. Massive blood transfusion will cause all except. This is a very, very important question. Massive blood transfusion. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you. Massive blood transfusion will cause all except. So what should be right answer here? Massive blood transfusion. Very good, very good. So many of you have given me correct answer. So first correct answer is given by Pragya. Pragya has given me answer as a A. Hypercalcemia will be not caused by massive blood transfusion. What it will be causing? Massive blood transfusion will be not causing hypercalcemia. It will be causing hypocalcemia. So first you tell me, what do you mean by massive blood transfusion? When you will say it is a massive blood transfusion, what is the definition? What is the definition of the massive blood transfusion? Can you tell me? Massive, yes, very good. A hypocalcemia will be seen by them. I will explain you. Massive blood transfusion means you are giving more than one blood volume within, can you tell me within how many hours? Very good, very good. Pragya is telling within 24 hours. Very good, very good. So it is within 24 hours. Right, so massive blood transfusion is defined as a more than one unit of the blood volume. One unit of the blood volume means more than five liters of the blood. So when a patient is coming to your trauma ward and within 24 hours from the admission to the 24 hours, you are giving more than five liter, which is approximately equal to the 10 blood bags. Approximately 10 blood bags will be there, right? So when you are giving more than 10 blood bags to the patient within one day or within 24 hours, this was the question in exam within 24 hours is the massive blood transfusion more than 5 liter within 24 hours of the admission is massive blood transfusion. So what will happen because of the massive blood transfusion <coughs> you are giving more than 10 blood bags. So first of all blood bag is kept at 2 to 6 degrees Celsius right. So patient will develop hypothermia. So this will be seen right. So hypothermia will be present because of the lower temperature of the blood bag. So hypothermia is one of the complication right. Second thing, <coughs> blood bag is having lot of citrate, right? So there is more citrate and this more citrate will be causing citrate toxicity. What will happen? Citrate will go to the liver. Can you tell me what will be forming in the liver after metabolism? No, calorie reduction by 30% will not decrease the aging. It is calorie restriction. Reduction will not. If you reduce the calorie, you will have malnutrition. That's all. Very good. Metabolic alkalosis. Bicarbonate will be formed here. Right. So bicarbonate will be formed in excess amount because of more citrate, more bicarbonate. And because of more bicarbonate, they will have a metabolic alkalosis. So this is the third complication of the massive blood transfusion. Right. So metabolic alkalosis will be there. Right. So metabolic alkalosis, citrate toxicity, number one, they are causing uh, metabolic toxicity. And one more thing, what they will do, they will also chelate the calcium. So there is a excessive amount of the chelation of calcium. And because of chelation of calcium, what you will see? Hypocalcemia. So that is what you have to remember. Right. So this is the fourth complication, right? So hypocalcemia will be present. So what we are seeing here, hypothermia, citrate toxicity causing metabolic alkalosis and hypocalcemia. So it is not hypercalcemia, right? It is a hypercalcemia. You have to be very careful about these kind of sharp twist in your exam, right? So what I am saying here, if there is a RBC damage is going on, so what will happen because of RBC damage, potassium will release from them and hyperkalemia will be there. So now you understand what I'm saying, they will be having hyperkalemia also. But remember, due to metabolic alkalosis, there will be hypokalemia. So this is interesting point you have to remember. Not in the same patient it will happen, but you will see the both condition, hypokalemia and hyperkalemia, both can happen in a massive blood transfusion. So if examiner asks you, so now you can see that the option B, hyperkalemia, and option C, hypokalemia, both will be seen. 
hypothermia will be also seen. So, who is more common? In case, if examiner says that in massive blood transfusion, what is more common? So, always remember hypokalemia is more commoner than hyperkalemia. So, this point we have to keep in mind. If examiner is, suppose examiner is giving both the option and asking you to choose a single best answer, right? So, answer should be hypokalemia will be more common after massive blood transfusion, right? So, now you understand in massive blood transfusion, in massive blood transfusion within 24 hours you are giving more than 5 liter and hypocalcemia will be there, not hypercalcemia, right? Hyperkalemia, hypokalemia both will be there, but hypokalemia is more common, hypothermia will be there and metabolic alkalosis will be seen. It is metabolic alkalosis, not acidosis, right? Coming to the next question. This is again a very, very important topic. I assure you, you are going to one get one question either from this question or from the explanation of this question, what I am going to give you. So, tell me what will be right answer for this question. Finding of a patient is given below. All are true about this anemia except so, now you can see this is present, this is present, this is present and you have to find out. So, so, tell me what should be diagnosis also in the comment box if you can write. Alia, Pragya, Ritesh, Sheikh, all these people have given me the first correct answer. Very good, very nice. So, I have got first correct answer from uh, all of you. This is the D which is the correct answer. Most common genetic change is not deletion. So, first of all, we should know that. What is this anemia? Sorry. Right. So, what I am showing you, this is a non, which is not a very specific finding, right? What is this? It is also called as hair on end appearance. Hair on end appearance and it can be seen in any hemolytic anemia. Right. So, it is not very specific. It can be seen in any hemolytic anemia. Right. So, it is not very specific finding. But here, what I am showing you, if you look at this diagram, you can see there is a fish mouth vertebra. Hai. So, this is a fish mouth vertebra. Right? Fish mouth vertebra is a complication of vaso occlusive crisis in a sickle cell anemia. And if you look at this, see, whenever you see a peripheral smear, you must remember to look at the five areas 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Means all corners and the center. When you are looking at the all these area, can you notice what are these cells which I am marking? Can you see these two cells? This one, this is again. So, whenever if you notice this cell, you can easily make it out what are these two cells, right? Easy? Sickle cell, right? So, what is the anemia? Sickle cell anemia. So, our diagnosis for this question is sickle cell anemia, hair on end appearance, fish mouth vertebra and sickle cell anemia that sickle cells are seen in this peripheral smear, right? You are seeing many target cells also, so you need not to worry about the target cell because when you see the sickle cell, you have to focus on the sickle cell anemia, that's all. Don't get deviated, KRSR's target cells are also there, right? So, in sickle cell anemia, can you tell me what is the most common genetic change? This is again a very hot topic right now in exam. Most common genetic changes are deletion or point mutation. So, your answer should be point mutation. What kind of point mutation? Can you tell me? Sickle cell anemia will be having nonsense or which mutation will be present? Missense or nonsense? Which point mutation? Missense or nonsense? Tell me. Missense or nonsense. Very good. Pragya has told me the first correct. Pragya, Alia, very good. It's a missense point. See, it's a mnemonic. We can remember like that. No? Sick will miss. That's all. Sick will miss. Those who are sick, they will miss the lecture. Right? Like that. Sick will miss. So, this is the mnemonic to remember. Sickle cell will be having missense type of point mutation. Right? So, this is a missense. Why it is called as missense? Why it is called as missense? Because in this, Glutamic acid is replaced by valine, right? And we all know that glutamic acid is a polar amino acid, right? Which is soluble and valine is non-polar and insoluble. So, what I am showing you, try to understand what I am showing you here. This is called as missense. Why it is called as missense? Because of this point mutation, sense of amino acid has been changed. 
and what was the sense of the amino acid they were polar and soluble when it was glutamic acid normal hemoglobin they were they were polar they were soluble but now when they have been changed into valine their sense has been changed they are non polar now they are insoluble so that is why we are saying miss sense point mutation will be present in the sickle cell anemia because there is a non sense point mutation which came in earlier in exam can you tell me non sense point mutation means means there is no change so who will do this can you tell me non sense point mutation who will do who will do this nonsense codons or stop codons nonsense or stop codons means there will be no change in the sense only the chain quantity will decrease here quality is getting altered in sickle cell anemia quality is getting altered who was polar and soluble in quality now they have changed their quality from the non polar to the insoluble that's all but nonsense point mutation you are going to see the no change only the quantity will decrease amino acid is not getting altered and this will be seen in beta thalassemia right so these are the two questions we have to remember in non sense point mutation what is happening stop codon is stopping the or causing the mutation and it will be seen in beta thalassemia right and miss sense point mutation is seen in sickle cell anemia so this is the fourth option right now <coughs> who will be affected by this anemia who will be affected by this anemia indian or afriko american kids so this is sometime examiner says right afriko american kids are affected so please remember this is a true statement afriko american kids are commonly affected so black individual are commonly affected by the sickle cell anemia this is the true statement right see why we should see images whenever you are feeling bored na you just go through the images of the robins all right just flip through the images don't read about them right just see the right uh, images and some lines below those images that's enough see i'm showing you for example i'm showing you here can you see this baby how is this baby how is this baby is a afriko american baby right so now understand who will be commonly affected afriko american and what age group will be commonly affected so who is this it's a child right so afriko american pediatric anemia whenever examiner says afriko american pediatric anemia which cell you are going to see or which anemia you will expect so you will expect sickle cell anemia that's all and what is uh, what is the uh, you know inheritance autosomal recessive inheritance pattern will be there so that is how you will see so what we are seeing in this picture can you tell me this was the question in our exam what we are seeing in this picture sickle cell anemia autosomal recessive afriko american if you look at the hand how is it hand and feet they are all swollen right why they are swollen because of ischemic infarction was so occlusive crisis and this is <coughs> sickle cell anemia because of ischemic infarction you can see this condition is called as dactylitis right this is the inflammation and swelling of digits right due to ischemic infarction and it is a part of vaso occlusive crisis right so this is a part of vaso occlusive crisis so sickle cell anemia because of vaso occlusive crisis we are going to see this right so that is the point you have to remember right so dactylitis we are seeing a afriko american pediatric baby who is showing you inflammation and swelling of the fingers both hand and feet and this is called as dactylitis and it's a part of hand foot syndrome right so this was the question also in exam that dactylitis is seen in which anemia or hand foot syndrome is seen in which anemia so it is a sickle cell anemia right so by this picture see by seeing this picture you will never forget right this is a afriko american pediatric patient who is commonly affected by the sickle cell anemia right so commonly seen in afriko american kid that diagram is given to help dactylitis see that image is also telling dactylitis the vaso occlusive crisis will be seen here sodium diethionate is used for screening that is a very very important screening test for sickle cell anemia right so this is the screening test and this is a true statement also right so sodium diethionate test is a screening test for the sickle cell anemia can you can you tell me can you tell me how you will confirm the diagnosis of sickle cell anemia so i'm just moving on to the next page where uh, other images are seen and meanwhile i am expecting what will be investigation of choice to confirm the diagnosis of sickle cell anemia 
and see in this diagram uh, we can clearly observe that these are crew hair cut or hair on end appearance as i said uh, you are seeing the bone spurs which are perpendicular on the skull surface so these are the perpendicular bony spur right and this is the fish mouth vertebra sickle cells are present here i want to ask you two question if you find osteomyelitis in sickle cell anemia this was the question in exam so which infection will be commonly associated staph or salmonella hplc is not investigation of choice please remember sickle cell anemia because uh, some of the older guidebooks now they will be writing hb electrophoresis is the right answer right but if you uh, if you find hplc is given hplc will be better answer but nowadays it has been changed which i had been asked in exam also nowadays it is called as gene sequencing please remember gene sequencing how we will do the gene sequencing by polymerase chain reaction or by next generation sequencing ngs is a next generation sequencing right so please remember this point this is a new thing which examiner is asking nowadays gene sequencing it is not only the sickle cell anemia for any hemoglobin disorder for any hemoglobin disorder so it can be thalassemia also i understand so it can be any hemoglobin disorder which can be which can be sickle cell anemia also which can be thalassemia also so for all of them what should be the best answer gene sequencing how we will do by pcr or next generation sequencing please 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 remember this is the right answer when examiner ask you a lady is suffering from the hemoglobin disorder what should be the investigation of choice your answer should be gene sequencing right that should be your answer that is what you have to expect in your exam also right now uh, here i had asked you one question in osteomyelitis who is most common cause so many of you are writing staph staph is not most common see when we talk about in a sickle cell anemia please remember i am talking about sickle cell anemia osteomyelitis i am not talking about general general is a staph right in sickle cell anemia most common most common is because of salmonella please remember this is the important mcq which will come in your exam mark my word this is going to come in your this exam salmonella is the most common cause of osteomyelitis in sickle cell anemia this topic is very important you are going to get one question in your exam on 4th of the june you will see this right uh nestroff test is a screening test for the thalassemia somebody is written so i am just writing it nestroff is a screening test this is the screening test for thalassemia not confirmation confirmation is by gene sequencing so all hemoglobin disorder thalassemia hemoglobin o hemoglobin arab sickle cell anemia any hemoglobin disorder investigation of choice is the gene sequencing by pcr or next generation sequencing that's all clear eh? now we'll be moving on to the next question all are reduced in iron deficiency anemia again i will again say that these are the topics where you are going to expect question in your exam all of the following are reduced in iron deficiency anemia except so what should be right answer here it's a very simple question very good so it is a tibc many of you have given correct answer so it's a quickly came out right so it is a tibc which will be increased in iron deficiency anemia right total iron binding capacity tibc is total iron binding capacity which will be increased percentage saturation of transferrin will be decreased our body will require more iron absorption and for that more iron absorption hepcidin level should be low right so it will be also decreased serum ferritin will be also decreased so i will explain you all these things right don't worry so to explain iron deficiency anemia first i will show you some of the images which you should know that right because uh, why i am showing you uh, this signs and symptoms of the iron deficiency anemia because this was the question in your exam previous year exam right they have given uh, this picture and they had asked which of the following treatment will cure this disease so iron treatment will cure this disease because this is seen in iron deficiency anemia you have to give iron treatment right so that was the that was a simple question so what is this can you see the fingers and the nail they are like a spoon and they are very thin thin and they are making a spooning so abnormal thinness because of the concavity so you can you can remember this abnormal thinness is there 
abnormal thinness and they are getting a spoon like appearance right a spooning is present so concavity of the fingernail is called spooning of the fingernail what is this called as this is can you tell me what is this coilonychia so whenever you see coilonychia it's a quite important sign of the iron deficiency anemia see whenever patient is coming to you right whenever patient is coming to you and he is talking to you and you can see the nail if nails are like this coilonychia then you can have a sure shot diagnosis that it will be having iron deficiency anemia right and on radiological examination you can notice there are so many constrictions so these constrictions are the esophageal webs right so when you find multiple esophageal constrictions it means it is a esophageal web can you see the uh, tongue these are having red shiny smooth tongue which is called as glossitis right so glossitis esophageal web coilonychia Kilosis, can you see the angle of mouth? They are having fissures or red color. You can see there is a cuts, small, small cuts, which we call fissures, right? Fissures at the corners of the mouth. This is called as kilosis or angular stomatitis. So if I if I combine all of them together, kilosis, glossitis, esophageal web, and coilonychia. So can you tell me these are Four things which are collectively known as one syndrome. Can you tell me the name of syndrome? Yes, very good. Bargwensh is telling this is plumber Vinson syndrome. Very nice. In anemia of chronic disease, serum ferritin will increase. Right. Right. So now you can see this is a Prader, uh, sorry, Patterson Cali syndrome or plumber Vinson syndrome. So now suppose a patient has come to you with kilosis, with glossitis with esophageal webs and coilonychia, right? All four are there. Now you make a diagnosis of plumber Vincent syndrome. Clinically, you are sitting in your OPD and patient has come. So now tell me what will be the basic worry of your mind regarding this patient? Or you can say, what will be the risk of this patient? They have increased risk of which cancer? I'm asking you directly, which cancer risk will be more? Which cancer? Now understand why, why examiner asks these questions so that you can correlate when you see these kind of patient who is having plumber Vincent syndrome like feature it's not you should not happy that I have diagnosed it you should know that you should anticipate what will be the future of this patient this patient is going to become a future case of esophageal cancers right so esophageal carcinomas right so squamous cell carcinoma especially squamous cell carcinoma Right? So, this point is very, very important for the plumber Vincent. Right? So, it's done. Now, coming to the hepcidin. These are again question. Can you tell me what is hepcidin? Which, uh, which organ will synthesize this enzyme? What is the source? What is the origin of this enzyme? Which organ? See, the name itself is telling hepcidin. Hep. Who will form this? Very good, Alia. It is liver. Right? That is also a very important question. It is liver which is going to form the hepcidin right so hepcidin is synthesized in which organ it is enzyme synthesized by liver right so synthesis will be done in the liver so that is the point as name suggests hepatic hepcidin right these hepcidins are also called as master regulator of iron metabolism right so master regulator of iron metabolism this is a phrase which hematologists use, right? Master regulator of iron metabolism is hepcidin, right? So, hepcidin is a master regulator of iron metabolism. And what will happen? So, uh, now you can see how hepcidin is associated with iron absorption and iron mobilization from the storage site. It's very simple. Just listen to me. Whenever hepcidin is getting increased, na, both will be decreased. So, they are having inverse relation. Now, understand this point. Whenever hepcidin will increase in our body, what will happen? Iron absorption will be decreased. Iron mobilization from the storage site will be also decreased. Right? Got the point? So, what happens in iron deficiency anemia? Right? In iron deficiency anemia, first thing which you will notice, see I am talking about iron deficiency anemia. First thing you will see, serum ferritin. Right? It is getting decreased. So, we can also ask this question like this, which is the most sensitive test for iron deficiency anemia or earliest to decrease in iron deficiency anemia is serum ferritin, right? 
So if serum ferritin has been decreased, can you tell me, can you tell me what will happen to the transferrin? Can you tell me what will happen to the transferrin? What is transferrin? What will transferrin? Transferrin is a carrier protein. So it will carry iron from the blood, from the serum to the bone marrow, right? So see what I am saying, transferrin will carry ferric iron, right? They will carry ferric iron from serum. See, I am writing serum here and then it is carrying them to the bone marrow, right? So bone marrow is there, is the, it's a erythroblast, right? Bone marrow precursor, erythroblast is there, which is having transferrin receptors, right? They are having transferrin receptors. So now this transferrin will come to the peripheral, no, sorry, into the bone marrow and this ferric ion will be taken by transferrin receptor to convert them into ferritin, the storage product, right? So because in iron deficiency anemia, as I have told you, initially serum ferritin will decrease. So bone marrow will require more iron, right? Right, bone marrow is requiring more iron. Right, so if bone iron is requiring more iron, so who will bring this? More transferrin. So that is why transferrin will be more. Right, because iron requirement is more. So transferrin will be more. And whenever transferrin is more, total iron binding capacity will be also more. Because what is total iron binding capacity? It is a capacity of transferrin to bind with iron. Right, it is a capacity of iron to combine with transferrin, right? So whenever transferrin is more, total iron binding capacity will be more. But what is happening in iron deficiency anemia? Because there is a deficiency in the iron, right? So I'm just showing you one ferric ion, but there is more amount of transferrin because bone marrow was expecting more transferrin to bring more iron, but more transferrin is there, but iron is less. So what will happen to the saturation of the transferrin? Understand, saturation of transferrin will decrease. So that is why there will be a decrease in percentage saturation of transferrin. Understand, so you got the point what I am saying. Serum ferritin will be decreased, transferrin will be increased, TIBC will be increased and percentage saturation of transferrin will be decrease. So transferrin and TIBC will increase, percentage saturation of transferrin is getting increased. So if you have seen hepcidin is like this, which is uh, opposite to the absorption. If hepcidin is more, iron absorption will be less. But in iron deficiency anemia, our bone marrow will require more iron absorption, right? More iron from the more iron absorption. So more iron, if you require more iron, what will happen? There will be decrease in hepcidin or increase in hepcidin, decrease in hepcidin. So that is what you have seen, right? Hepcidin will be also decreased. So that is the point you have to notice in iron deficiency anemia life finding. So you may get the question from the iron deficiency anemia, right? So that is the point you have to remember, right? So this is the point you have to remember in the iron deficiency anemia when we are seeing the lab finding. So now you can see in this question, again, I am showing you so that you can understand all are reduced. So TIBC will be increased because transferrin is increased. But percentage saturation of transferrin will be decreased. Our body require more iron absorption. For more iron absorption, hepcidin should be going down. And serum ferritin is the earliest marker to be decreased. Right. So that is the point you have to remember about iron deficiency anemia. Right. Now coming to the next point. A 30 year old female. This is again our question in exam. Right. 30 year old female came with complaints of neurological deficit showing pallor on general examination, her peripheral blood smear is given, what is most likely diagnosis? Simple question, most likely diagnosis. Right, so first correct answer is given by Alia and uh, Abhijit, very good. So Alia, Abhijit, Ritesh, very good. Right, so in this, uh, how you will diagnose the uh, megaloblastic anemia? See, this answer is very simple. 
right? Because we are seeing a clear cut picture here, which is the vitamin B12 deficiency causing megaloblastic anemia, right? So this is the megaloblastic anemia, which is causing this one, right? Why not it is a folate deficiency? Folate deficiency, how you will say that it is a folate deficiency in history, you will see the history of history of no intake of leafy vegetables, right? So leafy vegetables will be not there. So there is no intake of leafy vegetables that is the folate deficiency anemia, right? Same megaloblastic anemia picture will be there but history will be there that patient is not taking any leafy vegetable because leafy vegetable is the source of folic acid. So that is what you are going to expect. Right. So, how, how we can say that it is a megaloblastic anemia because in any, any anemia picture, right, what you have to do, you have to look for the three areas, right. So, you have to look for the triad of megaloblastic anemia, right. What is the triad of megaloblastic anemia which we are seeing here? I am just showing you in this picture, right. When you are going to see this, first of all, you will see macro ovalocytosis, right. So, when you are going to compare the peripheral smear, you can see here, there are there are RBCs. Can you see all these RBCs are having no central pallor? And first you have to identify normal RBC. Suppose I am showing you this one is the, which I am marking the here. This one is the normal RBC, right? This is the normal RBC, right? Why I am saying it is the normal RBC? Because they are having central pallor, which is 1 by 3rd of the diameter of RBC, right? So this is the central pallor. So whenever you find central pallor like this, right? Whenever you find central pallor like this, it means it is a normal RBC, right, which is one third. So now we compare these RBCs. So these RBCs are bigger, right. So that is why we are saying that this is the macro ovalocytosis. When you will say macro ovalocytosis, when MCV is how much, what should be the MCV level? What is the MCV level in macro ovalocytosis? What will be MCV level in macro ovalocytosis? is more than 100 femtoliter. Very good. So, it should be more than 100 femtoliter. MCV should be more than 100 femtoliter to show that it is a macro ovalocytosis. Sometimes examiner asks direct question. Patient was vegetarian and having MCV of more than 100 femtoliter because megaloblastic anemia is commonly seen in vegetarians, right? So, those who are vegetarians, they are commonly suffering from this macro ovalocytosis or megaloblastic anemia. So, first is macro ovalocytosis. Now, look at this thing. In this neutrophil, what we are observing? Normally, neutrophil will have 3 to 5 lobes. But here, how many lobes we are seeing? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, whenever you find more than 5 lobes, more than 5 nuclear lobes in a neutrophil, this will be called as hypersegmented neutrophil. So, this is a one of the specific finding. If examiner asks you, what is the most specific finding on peripheral smear? That is the hypersegmented neutrophil. More than five nuclear lobes will be present, right? So, that is hypersegmented neutrophil. And third, when you are going to observe here, can you see there is a blue color dot which is present in the RBC cytoplasm. So, these are called as Howell Jolly bodies. So, what is Howell Jolly body? These are the nuclear remnant. Right? If it is a nuclear remnant, so what it will be? RNA or DNA? Right? RNA or DNA? So these are the nucleus. Nucleus is having DNA, right? So what is this made up of? It is made up of DNA. So sometime examiner asks this question also, right? How well jolly bodies are made up of DNA, right? <coughs> because of the because of the uh, you know uh, ineffective erythropoiesis in the bone marrow, right? So, nucleus, nucleus of the uh, immature RBC will be present in the RBC when they will be coming to the peripheral blood. So, right now we are seeing the peripheral blood, right? So, when you find peripheral blood RBC is having nuclear remnant, that blue dot, that is, that is means that ineffective erythropoiesis is going on in the bone marrow. So, that is why that DNA remnant or nuclear remnant is coming, they are called as Howell Jolly body. And these are the characteristic triad of megaloblastic anemia. Please remember sometime examiner asked which is not a characteristic triad so in this you have to remember macro ovalocytosis hypersegmented neutrophil 
how well jolly bodies these three together are called as characteristic triad of megaloblastic anemia so come to the question so as i have told you in this question it has been given peripheral blood smear neurological deficit right and pallor neurological deficit is also one important feature which you will not see in the uh, you know folic acid deficiency anemia it will be commonly seen in megaloblastic anemia so that is very important point to remember right so as i have told you that this is number one right then macro ovalocytosis number two and then hovel jolly body number three so these are the triad of the megaloblastic anemia which will favor in the vitamin b12 deficiency in thalassemia how you will identify on peripheral smear remember thalassemia is the most common cause of target cells so when examiner says there are numerous target cells are seen in peripheral smear that time you have to suspect thalassemia that's all right how you will suspect iron deficiency anemia when examiner will write there is a microcytic hypochromic anemia so most commonly microcytic hypochromic anemia can be thalassemia also but when we are talking about most commonly who will be an example of this iron deficiency anemia will be example of this right so try to understand a few basic thing whenever examiner will say target cells are numerous which diagnosis you will think about thalassemia sickle cell anemia iron because all will be having target cells so most common cause will be thalassemia right that is what i have written on peripheral smear if you see numerous target cell your first diagnosis should be thalassemia right clear <coughs> right so iron uh, now you understand folic acid deficiency anemia leafy vegetable will be mentioned that was the question in previous year exam not in our exam but examiner can ask in your exam also right he leafy vegetable is not taking he is having megaloblastoid feature most likely deficiency is vitamin b12 or folic acid right so leafy vegetable means folic acid right when uh, completely vegetarian older individual and these uh, triad are present so you have to think about the you have to think about the megaloblastic anemia right now coming to this question this was previous year question what will be the origin of cell given in this image It's a good question, right? B cell, CD4, T cell, CMV infection or cytotoxic cells. Can you tell me in the comment box what is this cell which I am showing you here in this image? Can you tell me what is this in this image? Is it a, a CMV or a, see you all know that right? This is the owl eye appearance right? Owl eye appearance right? In this owl eye appearance what you are observing? This is the complete cell correct? This is the nucleus right? And in this nucleus what I am showing you, I am just, I am going to write here. This is the eosinophilic prominent nucleoli. Eosinophilic prominent nucleoli. So, what is this? In this, if there is a eosinophilic nucleoli, owl eye appearance, what you will think of? It is a CMV or it is a reed stern bugs. So, when you find eosinophilic nucleoli, is the reason for the owl eye appearance. Try to understand. When you find this, it means it is a classic Reed Sternberg cells and classic Reed Sternberg cells will be seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma. And what are these cells? Classic Reed Sternberg cells are B cells, right? So, what should be answer? It is a B cell, right? So, answer should be B cell. Classical Reed Sternberg cell is a B cell and what are the marker of the classical Reed Sternberg cells? So, remember this also which examiner asked in exam. They are CD15 positive and CD 30 positive. So, classical Reed Sternberg cells in Hodgkin's lymphoma, which you see in Hodgkin's lymphoma, they are CD15 and CD30, both will be positive, right? Owl eye appearance, eosinophilic nucleoli, when you see it is a, it is a, <coughs> in CMV infection, you will see intranuclear basophilic, means blue color, they will be blue color, here it is a pink color, eosinophilic. Basophilic means blue, B, B means blue color. So, intranuclear basophilic inclusion will be 
CMV infection, right? So that's the point you have to remember. Owl eye appearance. If you look at the owl eye appearance, I have shown you two things, right? So if you look at this, it is a Reed Sternberg cell. It is a cytomegalovirus because it is a showing eosinophilic. This is not viral inclusion. It is a nucleoli, right? And in CMV infection, what I am showing you, this is a viral inclusion, right? Viral inclusion. What is the color? Blue in color. Right, so both are owl eye appearance. It can be Reed Sternberg cell also. It can be cytomegalovirus infection also. That is how you have to identify. And now I am going to give a comparison. See this, two options are there. Now you can tell me who is Reed Sternberg cell and who is cytomegalovirus. A and B I have given you. Tell me. Now I am marking. Look at this area, and now I am marking this owl eye appearance. Right now, you can see in this owl eye appearance, look at this area inside the nucleus. How is the color of this nuclear inclusions? Right? So, it is blue in color, and this one is eosinophilic, or we can say red or pink in color. So, if it is red and pink in color, so it means it is a Reed Sternberg cells, which means it is a B cell. Right? And this one, because of the blue viral inclusion, so this will be picture of cytomegalovirus. Right, so how you will identify in exam? So if you look at the picture, you can compare the cells from the surrounding. These cells are bigger in appearance, right? Larger size. See the name of cytomegalovirus. Like large cytomegalovirus means cytoplasm is big because of this infection, right? So when you will uh, compare with the surrounding cells, they are very big in appearance and they will be having intranuclear basophilic inclusion. So that is how you will identify cytomegalovirus in your exam, right? So this is the important point for the question. Can you tell me what is name of this Reed Sternberg cell and what is this variety of Hodgkin's lymphoma? These are the two questions which examiner had earlier asked in exam. And I will give you a hint. Can you see the cell here? And you can notice the nucleus here. Right? Nucleus is here. Cell cytoplasmic border is here and between the cytoplasm, if you will see, they are all clear. There is nothing. They are clear cytoplasm. Because of the paraffin section preparation, it has been removed. Very good. This is the lacunar Reed Sternberg cell. Clear appearance means lacuna is formed. So, this is the lacunar Reed Sternberg cells. And lacunar Reed Sternberg cells are seen in which Hodgkin's lymphoma? <coughs> which Hodgkin's lymphoma? Nodular sclerosis type of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Nodular sclerosis type of Hodgkin's lymphoma, you will see lacunar Reed Sternberg cells, right? So, these are the questions. So, what will be the CD marker for lacunar Reed Sternberg cell? Can you tell me in the comment box? CD marker for lacunar Reed Sternberg cells? Very good, very good. All of you are giving me correct answer. That's good. It means you are well prepared, right? So, right now you have to just focus on revision. That's all. You are going right. Very good. So, it is a it is a CD marker. Same. Classical. Hai na? So, same. Rahega. CD 15 hoga or CD 13 positive. Hoga. Right. Can you tell me what is the meaning of sclerosis? What do you mean by sclerosis? What do you mean by sclerosis? Can you tell me in the comment box? What do you mean by sclerosis? Sclerosis means? Collagen, excessive amount of collagen deposition, right? So, here there will be excessive amount of collagen deposition and this collagen will form the nodular band or nodules. That is why name is nodular sclerosis. Collagen is forming band, right? This is a high power view. Here you cannot see. In, in low power view, you will see the collagen is forming band. So, why I am saying this? Because this was the question in exam. Collagen bands are seen in which Hodgkin's lymphoma? Nodular sclerosis type of Hodgkin's lymphoma. That was the question in exam, right? Collagen bands are collagen bands are seen in nodular sclerosis type of Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is the question which examiner will be asking, right? Can you tell me uh, what is name of this Reed Sternberg cell? Again, I am asking you. This is the previous year question. What is the name of this Reed Sternberg cell? And in which subtype of Hodgkin's lymphoma it will be seen. And I will, I will show you. This is how you have to identify the cells in your exam. You can see this is the cell. Right? This is the cell. And now look at the nucleus. How I am showing you. These are like polyp. 
right? You can see here also nucleus is having multiple lobes. So we are seeing cells like this. So can you tell me what is name of this cell? Very good, very good. Hari Haran has told me and, uh, and Abzal has told me correct answer. Very good. It's a lymphocyte predominant. It is a lymphocyte predominant, also known as nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. NLPHL, right? Nodular. N is nodular. Nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. And this Reed Sternberg cell is called as popcorn Reed Sternberg cell. That was the question in exam. Right? Popcorn Reed Sternberg cells are seen in nodular lymphocytic predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. Right? What will be the marker of pop, uh, popcorn Reed Sternberg cell? CD15 will be positive or negative? CD15 and 30, positive or negative? Fifteen and thirty because it's a nodular lymphocytic predominant, so it will be negative, right? CD fifteen and thirty will be negative, but when we will check, BCL six will be positive, CD twenty will be positive, and CD forty five will be positive. So these are the markers which will be present in the popcorn Reed Sternberg cell, right? Popcorn Reed Sternberg cells are also known as lymphocyte histiocyte rich reed sternberg cells right so lymphocyte histiocyte rich reed sternberg cells are called as popcorn reed sternberg cell that's the point you have to keep in mind right so that is the thing we have to remember yes right so cd1530 negative because it is not a classical hodgkin's lymphoma right lymphocyte predominant lymphocyte predominant is non classical right it is non classical that is why it is nodular lymphocytic predominant hodgkin's lymphoma separate group and they have popcorn Reed Sternberg cell, which is 15, 30 negative, but 6 positive, BCL 6 positive, 20 positive, 45 positive, right? So, these are the points we have to remember. And <coughs> sometime examiner repeat this question, right? So, already this question had been asked. Sometime examiner take this name, lymphocyte histiocyte rich Reed Sternberg cell, which is the another name of popcorn Reed Sternberg cell, right? Also known as this one. So, how you will identify lymphocyte histiocyte rich variant by seeing the Two important points. What I have shown you, can you see nucleus is looking like a polypoidal nuclear lobe, right? So polypoidal nuclear lobes are present, or you can say multi-lobated nuclei. So either this or that, polypoidal nuclear lobe or multi-lobated nucleus are seen. It means it is a popcorn Reed Sternberg cell. That is how you are going to identify. Popcorn Reed Sternberg cell and they will be having best prognosis, right? So please remember this cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma will be having best prognosis. Sometime examiner asks this question. Right? So now moving on to the next question. This is again a repeat question from your exam. What will be the chromosomal translocation in this given AML? See, I have written AML, right? Now you have to look into the diagram and you have to identify what will be the diagnosis, especially if you look at this picture. So what will be diagnosis? What we are seeing here in this, uh, you know, in this uh, blast cell, if I say that this is the blast cell, I, if I don't write, right, it's a, obviously it's a AML, so it is a myeloblast cell, right? So you all know that name has been given. Myeloblast cell, what we are observing, can you, can you notice this rod-like structure in the cytoplasm? So what are these rod-like structure in this myeloblast? These are our rods. Right. So basically, examiner is asking our red. Yes, very good. It's not smudge cell, it's our rods, right? So these are not smudge cells, these are our rods which we are seeing here, right? So our rods are most commonly seen in which AML? Can you tell me? 
Our rods are most commonly seen in which AML? Sometime examiner asked this question. So, which AML it is most common? Can you tell me? <coughs> which AML you will be seeing our rods most commonly? So, our rods are most commonly seen in AML. AML M3. What is M3? It is acute promyelocytic promyelocytic leukemia right so acute promyelocytic leukemia is aml m3 right and in this patient what translocation you will see translocation 1517 right so this translocation is between pml promyelocyte gene versus retinoic acid receptor alpha so that was question in your previous year exam pml rara right sometimes they write rara alpha means rara right so PML, RARA, both are same thing, right? So RARA or retinoic acid receptor alpha. RAR is retinoic acid receptor alpha, right? So PML, RARA, alpha is AML, M3. So which translocation will be seen in AML, M3? So now you got the answer. Answer is 1517, right? 1517 will be there, right? So, this is the point, this is the right answer for this question. What I want to say that this AML, can you can you tell me in clinical presentation, they are commonly associated with, what is the clinical presentation in this patient? Our dots are most commonly in AML M3. What will be very characteristic presentation in this patient? They will be presenting with, they will be presenting with DIC, right? So, please remember whenever examiner is giving you disseminated intravascular coagulation, right? Whenever examiner will give you DIC feature, so their PT will be prolonged, APTT will be prolonged, platelet count will be decreased, bleeding time will be prolonged. So this kind of feature will be given to you in your exam and examiner will say that this patient is having AML, what translocation will be seen. So now understand, AML is basically, uh, which AML is commonly associated with DIC, AML M3. And what will be the what will be the uh, translocation in DIC uh, in this AML which is having DIC because it is M3 so it is translocation 1517 got the point so this is the point right now coming to the next question a 56 year old male came with dragging sensation in abdomen and examination there was a massive splenomegaly high TLC thrombocytosis peripheral smear is showing myelo metamyelo promyelo band forms of the neutrophil what will be most likely so, what will be most likely translocation you are going to see in this patient? <coughs> what will be most likely translocation? Very good. Uh, Viji Raj and Ritesh Kandelwal has given me first and prompt correct answer, right? So, this is a very peculiar, see history itself is telling, you need not to look into the, you know, uh, microscopic examination of the aspirate or peripheral smear, right? This is very clearly in, given in history. See, thrombocytosis is there, right? Older male, massive splenomegaly, myelocyte, metamyelocyte, all these are immature neutrophil, right? So, myelocyte, metamyelocyte, promyelocyte, band form, all these are giving hint for immature neutrophil precursor, right? So, these are immature neutrophil precursor. So, immature neutrophil precursor plus thrombocytosis, Massive splenomegaly, older male. So, what will be our provisional diagnosis? CML. I understand. Our provisional diagnosis. Now, we are assuming that it can be provisional. No, it's, there is no smudge cell here. No smudge cell. Smudge cells are characteristic. They are not diagnostic. Right? They will be seen in CLL. Smudge cells will be seen in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Right? So, in CML, what will be diagnostic finding? Philadelphia chromosome. And what is Philadelphia chromosome? Translocation 9 to 22. So, this should be the right answer, right? So, answer will be A. So, CML answer should be A, translocation 922. Can you tell me translocation 822, which condition you will see? 922 is done, CML. What are the other options? 822, where you will see 822? 814? 822 and 814, both will be seen in? Burkitt's lymphoma, right? Yes, very good. Burkitt's lymphoma will be having 814 and 822. 
where you will see 14, 18, which was our earlier question in our exam. 8, 14, 18. 14, F for follicular. F, 14, 18. 14, 18. 14, follicular. 14, 18 will be seen in follicular lymphoma. Right? So, this will be seen in follicular lymphoma. Right? Now, I will, I will just show you uh, this picture. In this image, what are the things you have to observe? Because this image had been asked in exam previous year. They have uh, marked the cells and they have add, asked us to identify what are the cells, right? So, I will just show you a picture here, <coughs> right? So, first of all, we will see here that what are these cells? When you are going to see a cell with very roundish nuclei like this, right? So, this is the myelocyte, right? Myelocyte, right? When you are going to see uh, there is a there is a very deep cleft like this in this nucleus, right? So nucleus is like this. This will be the metamyelocyte. Deep cleft is metamyelocyte. So these are all neutrophil precursor, right? This one where you are seeing the S shape or not a complete segment of the neutrophil. What is this? This is the band form, right? So these are the band form. Right, so band form, right, huh? how to connect now, Is it okay now? Yes, this class is going on. Right, so, right, so band form, you can see band form, myelocytes, right, so these are all, all neutrophil precursors, right, so these are all immature neutrophil, so I am just writing new, neutrophil immature precursor, right, so neutrophil immature precursor, neutrophil immature precursors are there, right, so in this peripheral smear, actually the question was, identify the cells in this peripheral smear, so I have those cells, can you tell me uh, what is this cell, where you are seeing a uh, you know eosinophilic cytoplasm where you can see there is a eosinophilic cytoplasm and nucleus is having multiple bands. So what is this? What is this? This is a picture of eosinophil. Right? So this is a eosinophil. You have to identify cells like this because cytoplasm will be granular and eosinophilic. Right? So all these cells which are, which we are seeing here, these are all eosinophils. These are all like this. Right? So these are eosinophil. Now look at this cell. Can can you identify this cell? This cell. If you look at this cell, right? In this, you can see uh, nucleus is like this, but cytoplasm is dirty blue in color. So we will say like this: dirty blue granular cytoplasm. So, when you find a mononuclear cells with a dirty blue granular cytoplasm, so these are basophils, right? These are basophils. Normally, no basophil will be seen in our peripheral smear, 
but when you find basophil on peripheral smear so that will be a feature of cml right so eosinophil is there basophil is there right this one is the normal neutrophil right so just i am writing here this one is the normal neutrophil so that is how you will identify this is the normal neutrophil right all these cells are basophil so these are basophils which we are seeing in this peripheral smear right so that is how you have to identify band form eosinophil neutrophil right lymphocyte you will identify it's a mononuclear cell right so eosinophil eosinophilic granular cytoplasm will be there and basophil will be having dirty granular blue color of the cytoplasm which will be the basophil right so that is how you will identify a cml in cml all the immature cell precursors will be high so whenever uh, whenever we see this kind of peripheral smear whenever we see this kind of peripheral smear right whenever we see this kind of peripheral smear so our presumptive diagnosis see what i am saying provisional diagnosis our provisional diagnosis will be chronic myeloid leukemia because the older patient massive splenomegaly immature cell right immature cell means that uh, myelocyte metamyelocyte band form along with basophilia and so much of platelet count also you can see thrombocytosis is there so we are making provisional diagnosis of the cml so how we will confirm this provisional diagnosis how we will confirm this provisional diagnosis this we will confirm by seeing the philadelphia chromosome right so what is philadelphia chromosome you can see here chromosome 9 and 22 translocation from chromosome number 9 abl is present and it is getting translocated to bcr so this will form the bcr abl fusion gene sometime examiner asked this question right so what is this it is a translocation of 9 to 22 which which chromosome 9 to 22 which arm so remember it is always between the long arms of the chromosome it is between the q to q long arm to the long arm so 9 chromosome long arm can you see this this is the long arm of the 9th chromosome this is the long arm of the chromosome 22 so abl is present on long arm bcr is present on long arm this translocation will be on the long arm so it is between the long arm of the chromosome 9 to 22 so it is always from the long arm q to q right so what is the protein name bcr abl fusion gene which is also known as philadelphia chromosome and this will activate abnormally which enzyme tyrosine kinase activity so that is how you will you will identify this is a this is a case of cml so how you will do this how you will do this what is the investigation of choice to confirm sometime examiner asked this question investigation of choice to confirm the diagnosis of cml so answer should be fish right answer should be fish fish is the investigation of choice to confirm so on fish only we are going to see all this that philadelphia chromosome will be seen on the fish right no flow cytometry will be not there flow cytometry will be not there right now coming to the next question this is again a previous year repeat question i am just making uh, another question from that so you can see this question which of the following will be seen in this tumor so you can see uh, there is a africo american child and there is a lymph node biopsy so what will be your diagnosis lymph node biopsy africo american child so what will be your answer in this case Very good. So, many of you are giving me correct answer. It's a Burkitt lymphoma. Absolutely correct. Right. Hemant has given me. Hemant, Satish Kumar, uh, Faiz, uh, Ankita. Right. So, they are the first one who gave me the correct answer. Very good. So, I think majority of you have got the correct answer. What I'm showing you here, can you tell me what will be diagnosis of this patient? Is it endemic Burkitt lymphoma or is it a sporadic Burkitt lymphoma? Just I'm asking. Very good. Very good. Who is given this answer? Abzal has given me it's a endemic type of very good Abzal it is the endemic Burkitt lymphoma because endemic Burkitt lymphoma why I'm saying it is endemic Burkitt lymphoma because endemic Burkitt lymphoma is seen in African child right so you can see this is an African child 
and their most common site is face in the mandible. This is the most common site, right? This is the most common site means face, which will be affected by the Burkitt lymphoma, right? So I am showing you this is a picture of endemic Burkitt lymphoma, right? And in this, when you are going to take the biopsy from here, what we are seeing? What we are seeing? We are noticing so many macrophages are there. So many macrophages are there here. You, you can see these are all macrophages, foamy macrophages because clear cytoplasm is there, right? So we will say that foamy or clear cytoplasm, foamy macrophages, right? So these foamy macrophages are like a star. Right, and you can see a small round blue cell tumor. Can you notice all these are all these clusters are a small round blue cell tumor? We will say that this is a small round because they are blue in color. A small round blue cell tumor. If you if you just notice the name blue, who is blue? Stars or a sky? Right, it is a stars. Who are blue a sky which is blue in color not stars a sky so because of this small round blue it will be called as a sky appearance so this is star and a sky starry a sky appearance so whenever you find a starry a sky appearance this is the biopsy of Burkitt's lymphoma and in Burkitt lymphoma which translocation will be seen most commonly 814 right which will be giving rise to C MIC translocation. This was a previous year question. C MIC translocation is seen in Burkitt lymphoma, right? So C MIC translocation is seen in Burkitt lymphoma, which is giving you translocation 814. So right answer is translocation. Sorry, right answer is translocation 814. C is the right answer, right? So translocation 814 is the right answer. Where you will see translocation 1114? Can you tell me in the comment box? 1114. Translocation 1114 will be seen in which condition? Which lymphoma? This was the question in exam. 11, 14. Mantle or follicular? I am giving you option. Mantle or follicular? Who will be having translocation? 11, 14. Eleven fourteen is... 11, 14 is seen in mantle cell lymphoma very good so those who have given me mantle cell lymphoma that is the exactly answer which examiner will be wanting right so it is a mantle cell lymphoma where you will see the 11 14 14 18 already we have discussed 14 18 is seen in which lymphoma follicular lymphoma so follicular lymphoma will be having 14 18 8 14 burkitt lymphoma 9 22 just now we have seen it is seen in chronic myeloid leukemia that's all Right, so 814 Burkitt lymphoma. So I have shown you this picture. This is the pediatric boy. Most commonly, face is the most common site. And where, which area? In face also, you have to remember mandible. So it is African child. So what is your diagnosis? This will be a case of endemic Burkitt lymphoma. Right, face and in face also, mandible is the most common site. And when we are going to see the biopsy, you are going to see starry sky appearance in Burkitt lymphoma. And what are the stars? Macrophages are the stars and a small round blue cell tumors are sky which we are seeing in this picture also, right? So what I am showing you here, it is a starry sky appearance which we will see in Burkitt lymphoma. Who are the stars? Macrophage. And who are the sky? It is tumor cells, right? So now you understand. So whatever macrophage we are seeing, they are stars these are all macrophages which are stars right and when you see these tumor cells the small round tumor cells are the sky so that is what we are going to see in the lymph node biopsy <coughs> now looking at this question this was again previous year question 60 year old male patient bone marrow aspirate is given what is most likely diagnosis what is most likely diagnosis of this bone marrow aspirate can you tell me Most likely diagnosis, plain cell, tennis racket cell, mott cell, lepidic cells. What should be answer? Very nice, very nice. Many of you are giving C as a correct answer, which is absolutely correct, right? So if you look at this, these are all abnormal plasma cells of the multiple myeloma, 
So what I'm showing you here, these are all abnormal plasma cells, right? What is why I'm calling them abnormal plasma cell? Because there is a excessive amount of M protein accumulation, right? So this excessive amount of M protein accumulation is giving a. Can you see the appearance? This M protein is giving like a inclusion inside the cell and they are looking like a blue in color. So, they are blue in color, basophilic, right? Blue and how is the appearance? Cluster of grape, blue cluster of grape-like inclusion. So, whenever you find blue cluster of grape-like inclusions, so it means these are mott cells. So, that is how you are going to identify mott in your exam it's a one of the very frequently asked question in exam right so mott cell is a excessive amount of m protein what is m means m means monoclonal monoclonal means tumor so these are all monoclonal protein means m protein means these are all monoclonal immunoglobulins right so igg igm all these are monoclonal right only one type of clone will be present only one type of clone means tumor cells so what is this it is a mott cells right flame cells are also seen in multiple myeloma but they will be having a they will be having a fiery red cytoplasm, fiery red cytoplasm. I will show you all these uh, images, but now I wanted to ask you one question. Tennis racket cells, where you will see tennis racket cell and I want to see how many of you are giving correct answer for this question. Tennis racket cell, which was a question in 2017 and 19. Tennis racket cells are seen in which condition? I am waiting for the correct answer. Tennis racket cells are seen in tennis racket cells are seen in which condition? So remember, it's not Langer and cell histiocytosis. Please remember, tennis racket cells are tennis racket cells are seen in. It is a variant of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, which is also known as sarcoma botryoids. Right? So, this is also known as sarcoma botryoids. Embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, also known as sarcoma botryoids. So, the, here you are going to see tennis racket cells. I will show you the difference between the Tennis racket appearance. Three. Tennis racket cell. Question is tennis racket cell. Cell is in sarcoma botryoids. When examiner will ask you tennis racket appearance. Understand? Tennis racket appearance. Then your answer should appearance means it will be a Langerhen cell histiocytosis. So that is the very, very important point you have to remember. Right? So tennis racket appearance will be seen in a Langerhen cell histiocytosis. That is the very important thing which we have to remember. Now you got this. Lepidic cells are present in cardiac myxoma right so lepidic cells are seen in cardiac myxoma so that is the point you have to keep in mind right so now we will see how to identify all these things right how to identify these things on examination right so that's the point i wanted to tell you uh, how you will identify this now look at this as i said excessive amount of m proteins which is also called as inclusions right inclusions there are two inclusions we will see if there is a cytoplasmic inclusion this will be called as russell bodies if there is a intranuclear inclusion this will be called as ducher bodies right so russell body is cytoplasmic nuclear bodies are 
Dutcher bodies. So, what are cytoplasmic? Russell bodies. What are nuclear? Dutcher bodies, right? When you see a cell, there are two named cells which we are seeing, Mott cell and flame cell. So, Mott cells and flame cells, these are the two types of cells which we have to remember. What we are going to see in this cluster of grape-like basophilic inclusion is called as Mott cell, right? Cluster of grape-like, see cluster of grape and how are they? They are blue in color. So, that is why we are saying basophilic inclusion. So, these are called as these are called as Mott cells. When we are seeing fairy red cytoplasm, can you see this is called flame cell. So, now you understand in multiple myeloma, there are two inclusions, cytoplasmic inclusion, Russell bodies, nuclear inclusion, Dutcher bodies, two named cells, Mott cell. When there is a cluster of grape like basophilic inclusion, they are called as Mott cells. So, here is the Mott cell. When there is a fairy red cytoplasm, these are called as flame cells, right? So, look at this. This is what I have shown you. These are example of Mott cells which came in exam previous year and this is fairy red cytoplasm. So, you can see here we are noticing fairy red M protein accumulation, right? So, what is this fairy red M protein accumulation is called as flame cells, right? So, these are flame cells which we are seeing here, right? So, now you understand Mott cell and flame cells, Mott cells and flame cells, fairy red, these are all M protein deposition, right? These are all M protein depositions which we are seeing here, right? So, that is what, uh, okay, Sheikh, I, I will I will repeat, uh, a last point I will repeat, Sheikh, for you because Sheikh is requesting. So, here we can see <coughs> basophilic, basophilic deposition is Mott cell and Peri red deposition is flame cell, right? Now, coming to the tennis racket, what I have wanted to tell you about this, this is a very important point. When examiner says tennis racket appearance, please remember the language of the question. Tennis racket appearance is for the granule, which is called as Birbeck granule, right? And Birbeck granule is present in Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Please remember, this is a very important point. Birbeck granule is Langerhans cell histiocytosis and this will be seen on electron microscopy. When somebody says uh, tennis racket cells, so this is seen in light microscopy and these are rhabdomyoblast or tadpole cells, which is seen in rhabdomyosarcoma or sarcoma botryoides, right? Which is a embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma involving the vagina of the kid, right? So that is the point we have to remember. So here I will show you, this is how you will see tennis racket cell. This image had been asked several times in NB exam, so examiner can ask you. So, this is the electron microscopy of tennis racket. See what I have written? Appearance. So, that is what I wanted to emphasize more. You have to remember it is a appearance. Appearance means Birbeck granules and that will be seen in Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So, now you understand tennis racket cells are seen in tennis racket cells are seen in embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Tennis racket appearance will be present in the Birbeck granule of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, right? And this is the tennis racket cell. See, this is the light microscopy. What I am showing you, if you look at this cell, this is like a tadpole or tennis racket cell. So, this is the tennis racket cell of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma or you can say sarcoma botryoids. Right? So, these are the important point about the tennis racket. Now, coming to the next question. See, this is again a very important topic. Again, I, again I, 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 I will tell you, this is the question which is going to be asked in your this exam. You are going to get one question from this discussion for uh, around this uh, question, right, which I am going to discuss right now. Try a truck driver, a truck driver is suffering from pneumonia. He was showing you long histopathological examination as you can hear in given image, what is most likely doing. So, very simple question. You have to just observe here and tell me what is this, mucor, as per or crypto or TB. Very good, very good. Quickly, I am getting correct answer from you all. Uh, Ankita, Rai, Pragya, very good, very nice. Alia Khan, I uh, think Alia has retracted. Okay, Ankita, Rai, Aspergillus, very good. Those who are telling it is Aspergillus, beautiful answer it is, right? This is the Aspergillus which you should remember. Why I am saying Aspergillus? Can you see why the answer should be Aspergillus? Because they are having 
if you look at the uh, scepter can you can you see uh, the hyphae hyphae are forming acute angle branching and they are having several scepter so what i am showing you here is septate hyphae right septate hyphae and acute angle branching acute angle branching so when you find septate hyphae and acute angle branching your diagnosis should be aspergillus right that is why our answer is aspergillus right so now i will be i will be discussing about other also why not tb because tb will be having you know they will be having lymphocyte they will be having langerhans giant cells or foreign body giant cells so that is why this is not the right answer we are not seeing any lymphocyte we are not seeing any giant cell so it's not a you know tb cryptococcus how you will identify how you will identify mucor that we are going to discuss so now what i am going to discuss in a very brief manner but remember you are going to get one question in your exam from here i can assure you because every exam i am seeing a question is coming from these topics how you will differentiate aspergillus now you will understand aspergillus versus mucor mycosis so how you will identify aspergillus how you will identify mucor as i have told you in aspergillus you will see can you notice these are the hyphae how are the hyphae these are thin and they are making angle also so this is the acute angle branching so can you see this this is the acute angle branching that is what i am saying this branching is acute angle branching right and now you can see there are so many thin septas also so these are the thin septate hyphae acute angle branching when you find these two property right it means it is a aspergillus which was seen in this case right mucor why mucor will be asked in our exam why these are very commonly asked question why mucor will come because mucor mycosis is very commonly seen in the covid 19 infections so that is why we can expect mucor mycosis also they will be saying the covid patient was there there is a black crust or black fungus also sometimes they say because of their morphological feature right they will be looking black in color black crust so black fungus in the nose that was the question in your previous year exam also right so how it will be they, they are you can see that they are broad and they are broader they are, they are more broader in comparison to here right you can see they are more broader so broad and there is no septa a septate hyphae broad this is very important here you can see septas there are no septa a septate hyphae so broad a septate hyphae and they are showing you perpendicular branching can you see the branching is perpendicular so this is called perpendicular branching if you look at this this is perpendicular branching right 90 degree so perpendicular branching broad aseptate hyphae this will be mucor mycosis right so covid 19 patient this kind of biopsy report that's all this is the mucor mycosis what is the special stain for all these fungal infection so remember gomori silver methanamine stain gomori silver methanamine stain whenever you use silver na it's a basic concept basic concept silver will always make things black so fungus will be looking black in color right i will show you that picture also let me show you first these two uh, biopsies can you tell me what is a biopsy i am showing you aspergillus which one is aspergillus which one is mucor can you tell me in the comment box and i am seeing who is the aspergillus who is the mucor very good very nice so as i have shown you here there are thin septas right and you can see branching also which is acute angle branching so this is aspergillus and here if you look at them right what what we are observing hyphae are little bit broader and there are no septa and perpendicular branching so with this will be mucor mycosis right done so now you are able to understand thin septate hyphae acute angle branching can you see this thin septate hyphae acute angle branching aspergillus broader a septate hyphae perpendicular branching is mucor mycosis and how we will identify them so this is the silver methanamine this is the grow code silver methanamine stain this itself is a question in exam grow code silver methanamine stain is used for detection of fungal hyphae right for fungal hyphae and how will be the fungal hyphae can you see fungal hyphae are looking dark or black color that is how you will see dark or black color fungal hyphae will be seen so gomori silver methanamine stain is used for fungal hyphae this is the important mcq 
right so this is the special stain for the fungus right and fungus will be looking darker black in color that is how you will identify now coming to the cryptococcus how you will identify cryptococcus that was the previous year question also right so that is the point we have to remember cryptococcus first of all i will i will say that a cryptococcus is commonly seen in immunocompromised individual right or in a simple word whose immunity is low so who will be having low immunity so basically examiner will give you history that person is suffering from hiv aids or person is having diabetes mellitus so means immunity level will be down so whenever immunity level is down and patient is coming to the opd suppose hiv patient came to the opd right you admitted them because of the features of the meningitis and he died autopsy was done so this is the autopsy finding that was the question in exam right so what is this so what we are seeing in this autopsy finding can you see there are so many areas which are which are having cavities so these cavities are actually cysts or we can say that cystic cavities right these are cystic cavities small cystic and necrotic area and in that necrotic area can you notice there is a area which is glistening no, shiny area hai, glistening areas hai. so that glistening area is because of capsular polysaccharide of the cryptococcus right so now this is a very important topic so you will see minimum one or two question from here every exam they are asking right so now this is the glistening area gross finding of the brain right so glistening area due to the this thing so because of this numerous small small cysts are there so this is called as soap bubble appearance or soap bubble abscess so please remember so bubble appearance will be seen on gross examination also gross examination which right now we are seeing i will show them on light microscopy also and on special staining also everywhere you are going to see right so now you can see a patient of hiv came he died right you took out the brain autopsy you found out there are so many small small cystic spaces like this so you have suspected cryptococcus right we are suspecting we are not confirming to confirm we took the biopsy when we will take the biopsy on he section what you will see there will be empty area because this mc when we are going to see a uh, biopsy on he stain normally he stain we do like this so he stain you can see there is a there is a one area and this is the another area so these are the actually cryptococci these are the cryptococci so in between there is a capsule capsule is not capturing the stain so what i'm saying here this is the he stain and these are the clear area and this clear area is actually capsule of the cryptococcus <coughs> right because of this capsule it is a clear and that is why it is called as soap bubble appearance you now understand that is why it is called as soap bubble appearance you can see soap bubble appearance right so that area is vacant so you can see there is a area which is vacant so this is how we are going to observe them this is the soap bubble appearance that's what i'm showing you there is an empty capsular area and this is the reason for so bubble appearance on he section which i have i have shown you just now right so how you will confirm that because it can be artifact also it can be defect because of the sectioning so we will confirm it how we will confirm we will confirm this by using a special stain right this was the question in our previous year exam what is the best special stain for cryptococcus right now we are seeing a cryptococcus so bubble appearance so which is the best stain for the cryptococcus special stain it is not india ink please remember it is not india ink no it is not india ink not india ink we are talking about histological section india ink you will do on the smear when you are going to take out the csf when you are taking out the lumbar puncture and csf then you will apply the india ink preparation right not here see this it's a mucy carmine stain so remember this is the best special stain for cryptococcus that was the right answer in previous air exam mucy carmine stain capsule will become red now you will see that empty area which you are seeing here they will become red now you can see here so this is the mucy carmine stain right so that is how you have to understand best stain is mucy carmine stain and mucy carmine stain you can notice these are the red color cryptococcal capsule so this red color is the cryptococcal capsules which are 
visible so now i understand so cryptococcal is for tissue section now you understand i am i'm not talking about the smear we are talking about the tissue biopsy right so on tissue biopsy we have to use the mucicarmine stain now understand tissue biopsy mucicarmine but when examiner is talking about csf smear right then you have to think about negative staining and negative staining is india ink preparation so that itself is a very important mcq negative stain name is india ink preparation why it is called as negative why it is called as negative stain because organism is unstained and background is stained so as you can see this organism is unstained and background is stained right background is stained so that is what we are seeing here organism this is the organism right and this is the background so background is stained organism is unstained so this is example of cryptococcus negative staining india ink preparation right so this is also used for cryptococci this image was question in the 2020 right so that will be different color yellow color will be there but the crux is same background will be stained so bubble appearance you can see so bubble appearance is there so that is how you are going to identify so tissue section mucicarmine stain csf examination you have to use the negative staining which is a india ink preparation so that's what i said this mucor mycosis aspergillus and muc and this uh, you know uh, cryptococcal infection is very very important for our exam right now coming to the next question a female after cold exposure develop the following condition of the fingertips as shown in this image what will be most likely diagnosis cold exposure now tell me what should be the right answer this was the previous year question image based question you can see here some findings are there so what will be this tell me So what I am showing you here, uh, if you look at this, these are the digital amputation, right? We can say that these are the digital amputation. Why there is a digital amputation? This digital amputation is because of, because of ischemia, infarction leading to the necrosis of the fingers, right? So, what will be the reason for the necrosis of the finger? Because of the vessel vasculitis, because of the inflammation of the vessel wall. Inflammation of the blood vessel wall or you can say vasculitis. And this inflammation will be obstructing the small distal arteries and they are called as thromboangitis obliterans. So, this is called as thrombo. angitis obliterans right so thromboangitis obliterans which is also known as Burger's disease b u e r so remember this spelling is very important this is called Burger's disease which is a vasculitis right so see the name itself is telling what will happen thrombo thrombosis will be there blood vessel will be having inflammation angitis so because of inflammation and thrombosis there is a obliteration of the artery so because of this artery vein and all this obstruction there will be ischemia infarction necrosis and now fingers has been lost because of the necrosis so this is auto amputation which we will see in the third option burgers disease right so this is the right answer what will be the finding in giant cell arthritis can you can you write down in the comment box what will be the clinical finding you will see when a patient will be in front of you what will be the clinical finding in this case when you are seeing a uh, giant cell arthritis In giant cell arthritis, what we are going to see? In giant cell arthritis, what will be the finding? Can you tell me? 
so there will be a nodular thickening of the superficial temporal artery right that is what is also called as temporal arteritis you remember that is why it is also called as temporal arteritis right temporal arteritis because superficial temporal artery will be affected here right takayasu arteritis is also called as aortic arch disease because there will be a pulse difference that is why sometimes it is also called as pulseless disease right pulseless vasculitis right so most commonly it will be affecting subclavian artery please remember it is most commonly subclavian artery most common site is subclavian artery wegener's granulomatosis we all know that it is a small vessel vasculitis a small vessel vasculitis right and here you will see the <coughs> granuloma granulomatosis granuloma will be present in this also and in this also so this is a burgers disease just charger hoga kya Right, so now you understand this is how uh, we have to remember Berger disease there will be a smoker patient they are 42 years 30 to 40 years of the age group right right so as i was telling you uh, in a berger disease what will be the characteristic finding they will be a smoker right so usually nearly all patients nearly all patient will be having history of smoking so please remember history of smoking that is why in your clinical examination history of smoking is very very essential in this patient and universally all patient will be right all patient will be having this kind of features right so now i will just briefly i will tell you thromboangitis obliterans right thromboangitis obliterans what we are going to see as i have shown you here there will be a necrosis when you will see a biopsy you can see this is the blood vessel right an entire blood vessel lumen should be like this but lumen is not visible why lumen is not visible you can see in this lumen right you can see in this lumen just right in this lumen there are some of the inflammation can you see this is the inflammation that is why it is vasculitis because of this inflammation what are these red color thing these are the thrombi so entire entire blood vessel wall has been or entire blood vessel lumen not wall entire lumen has been blocked by thrombi so thrombi is blocking the lumen right blocking the lumen and leading to the ischemia infarction and necrosis so because of this necrosis what we are seeing the auto amputation of the fingers so that is what we are going to see thromboangitis obliterans which is also called as Berger's disease. So usually a patient will be uh, 40 years of the age group and a smoking history will be present. That is the important point, right? So they will be usually a smoker, <coughs> right? Now coming to the uh, this picture, this is how examiner had asked earlier in our exam also, right? So there is a segmental nodular thickening, segmental nodular thickening where what is this it is a superficial temporal artery right so what is this it is a superficial temporal artery so uh, when you will do the biopsy in this superficial see all these are inflammatory cells all these are inflammation small small round blue cells are small inflammatory cells now i wanted to ask you what are these bigger cells where you are seeing many nuclei in them these are these are multinucleated giant cells these are multinucleated giant cells so whenever you find multinucleated giant cells whenever you find multinucleated giant cells 
so it means it is a granuloma or granulomatous inflammation right so granuloma on biopsy superficial temporal showing a uh, segmental nodular thickening so what will be your diagnosis what will be your diagnosis in this case this is the temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis so this is the temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis that is how you will diagnose so if examiner asks temporal arteritis is a granulomatous disease answer is yes so that is the point you have to remember they are granulomatous disease because they will show you multinucleated giant cell right now this is the uh, <clears throat> arch of aorta you can see this is the aorta part right and what i am showing you here this is the intima this is the tunica media this is the tunica adventitia so usually intima is very thin but now intima is very thick here why because intima is showing fibrosis and because of this intimal fibrosis what is happening to the media media should be very thick but it is very thin so because of this fibrosis tunica media is showing you atrophy right so that is the point we have to remember tunica intima will be having thickening now understand tunica intima will be having thickening and media will be having atrophy because of this this thickening of the tunica intima media uh, intima because of this fibrosis only there is a atrophy of the tunica media is happening and when you will take the biopsy so again you are seeing so many inflammation can you notice so many mononuclear inflammatory cells are present and when you are going to see the biopsy report here what we are noticing this is again multinucleated giant cell so it means this is again a granulomatous inflammation so here also we are seeing the granuloma so this is see what i said this is the aorta right so this will be same picture in takayasu arteritis so takayasu arteritis and temporal arteritis on biopsy both will be having granuloma so on biopsy we can pathologist cannot say any diagnosis on biopsy only right so it will be basically clinical diagnosis how how you have taken the biopsy if you are saying that it is a, a specimen from the aorta so you will be going in favor of takayasu arteritis right when you are saying there is a superficial temporal artery which has been biopsied and showing the granuloma so that will be the giant cell arteritis temporal arteritis right Wegener's granulomatosis please remember it's a new name is granulomatosis with polyangiitis so examiner may use this name so please 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 do remember granulomatosis with polyangiitis see the name itself is telling granuloma with many inflammation in the blood vessel that is the granulomatosis so why i am saying because granulomatosis there also you will see the granuloma on the biopsy and what will be the feature they will be having triad right so they will be having triad what is the triad they will be having vasculitis which is a necrotizing remember it is a necrotizing means necrotizing means whenever they will cause damage they will cause cavity so that is why you will see cavitatory lesion in the lung so you will see lung cavity when lung will be involved they will be showing you cavity because of necrosis necrosis will eat all the cells and they will form the cavity so necrotizing vasculitis will be present right so that is how you are going to see the necrotizing vasculitis in this patient right then see one is vasculitis second will be respiratory tract involvement and respiratory tract involvement means any respiratory tract it can be upper respiratory tract also it can be lower respiratory tract also so how examiner will be giving you hint examiner will not be saying upper respiratory he will be telling ear discharge is there ear will be having some problem ear discharge or cavity is present in ear or ear will be having bleeding right along with the along with the lung problem means lung means they will say pneumonia right or any kind of hemoptysis like that and then he will say that necrotizing glomerulonephritis can you tell me wegener's granulomatosis which glomerulonephritis you will find in the comment box can you tell me which glomerulonephritis so it is rpgn rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis type 3 which is the most common type right so now understand these are the triad so see you have to apply clinically when a patient has come to you 
you are seeing the uh, you know uh, nasal septa perforation ear bleeding or ear problem or lung is having cavity on x-ray examination he is having kidney problem hematuria so you should think see this is how patient will come patient will not come to you as an mcqs you have to imagine you have to apply each and everything and when you revise more and more more and more then you remember these things that is what i am saying in the last moment when four days are remaining you have to give revision to your notes whatever you are having don't look for any other news source don't be, get distracted right so whatever you have learned here you keep revising keep revising that will come in your exam right and that will give you insight of the patient presentation also the granulomatous vasculitis respiratory tract involvement necrotizing glomerulonephritis so this will be our, our Wegener's granulomatous right now coming to the next question a patient was allergic to wheat this is again a very important topic and he was not able to eat this so wheat he cannot eat right wheat he cannot eat why because he will be having some diarrhea and all right so his serological examination was positive for anti endomycial antibody that was our previous year question also what will be most likely diagnosis simple question giardias is whipples celiac or amoebias is Right. So, very good. Many of you have given anti endomycel antibody is most specific antibody for celiac sprue. I will tell you two things. Celiac sprue diagnosis, na? how you will give the diagnosis. See, I will just show you celiac disease, some important point about the celiac disease. First of all, we should remember that celiac sprue is an autoimmune disorder. Please remember, number one, it is autoimmune disorder. Right? Is it infectious or non-infectious? So, that is the point you have to remember. Celiac disease is having no infection. It is not associated with any infection. Simple autoimmune disorder. Our own immune system is activated against our own cells in our GIT. Right. So, in pediatric age group, male, female will be common. But in adults, usually autoimmune disorder is commonly seen in females. So, in this case, if it is a pediatric, both male and female are same. But in adults, female will be commonly affected. So, it is an autoimmune disorder. So, who will be causing damage? immune cells are going to cause damage which immune cells will be causing damage sometime examiner asks so remember both cd4 t cells and cd8 cytotoxic cells will be causing damage in this disorder right so that is why we are saying immune mediated diarrheal so they will be having diarrhea and this diarrhea will be having more fatty substance in their stool right so this is also called as steato diarrhea or steatoria. So, remember this is the hallmark of malabsorption syndrome. So, that is why malabsorption syndrome. So, there will be malabsorption, right? So, why there is a malabsorption? Which is the reason for this malabsorption? Which is the reason for this malabsorption? Reason for this malabsorption is gliadin protein which is present in the cereals, right? Who is the, who is the culprit? Culprit is the gliadin protein and they are present in cereals. What are the cereals? We remember them by a mnemonic called BRO. B is barley, R is rye, O is oats and wheat. So, these are the substances. So, try to understand. If a patient is coming to us with this kind of celiac disease presentation, so which food he should be avoiding or which you will advise them to avoid? All these gliadin protein containing cereals, barley, rye, oats, wheat, bro. So, you will call him bro. Don't eat the bro. Understand, bro, don't eat the bro. So, barley, rye, oats, feed because this gliadin is going to problem. So, as I was telling you, how you will give the diagnosis of the celiac disease? So, celiac disease is not a, you know, single parameter will not give the diagnosis, right? Single uh, parameter will not avoid the, uh, not give the diagnosis. So, you have to use multiple things. Number one, number one important thing is the history of the gluten sensitive cereal. So, when he will be coming to you, he will be telling, sir, whenever I take, take the wheat or barley, rye, oats, whatever, this gliadin containing protein, I am having diarrhea, malabsorption, right? So, this history will be there. So, that is what it is given in the question also. He was eating wheat and he was not able to tolerate that thing, right? So, he will be telling and when he will discontinue, his symptom will be corrected automatically. He will remove the wheat from his diet, he will be fine. But once he will start, again he will become sick. So, that is what I am saying, history of gluten sensitive. Whenever he will eat, he will become sensitive, he will be having more diarrhea. Right. Second thing, endoscopic biopsy. Even though biopsy is not a diagnostic finding, but in biopsy, what you will see, there is a villi atrophy. Villi will be having atrophy and crypts. 
विल बी हैविंग हाइपरप्लेसिया राइट सो विल आई एट्रॉफी क्रिप्स विल बी हैविंग हाइपरप्लेटिया हाइपरप्लेसिया बट रिमेंबर बिकॉज ऑफ दीज टू थिंग्स दिस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एमसीक्यू म्यूकोसल थिकनेस विल बी सेम म्यूकोसल थिकनेस विल बी सेम इट विल बी नॉट अल्टर्ड बिकॉज द अमाउंट एट्रॉफी इज गिविंग suppose vilai is having normal vilai is having this much of thickness and they are getting atrophy right they are getting atrophy like this so whatever atrophy we are seeing crypt is here but now crypt is having hyperplasia so thickness here and here is same so that is why i am saying mucosal thickness will be same because vilai is showing atrophy crypt is showing you hyperplasia so that is the finding which is not diagnostic finding but along with the history of the gluten sensitivity of to the cereals and the serological finding that is very very important for exam as you can see in this question also there were two tests you can see and you have to remember right one is the transglutaminase and second is anti endomycial antibodies so transglutaminase is most sensitive test and anti endomycial is most specific remember these are the question which examiner ask most sensitive when examiner will ask you it will be iga antibody against which factor transglutaminase and most specific will be against anti endomycial antibody which can be iga or igg type so it doesn't matter you remember anti endomycial specific sensitive is transglutaminase that is how you are going to diagnose now you understand so that is why anti endomycial antibody is present so this will be a celiac disease right how you will identify giardiasis how you will identify whipples and amoebiasis these are very important image based question which i am going to describe now right so see whenever we are talking about whipple's disease try to understand whenever we are talking about whipple's disease who will cause whipple's disease whipple's disease are caused by gram positive bacteria what is that name what is the name of that gram positive bacteria Tropheryma vipelii, right? So Tropheryma vipelii is the gram-positive bacteria, which will be causing this malabsorption disorder, right? So this will be affecting the small intestine, right? So small intestine will be affected. So what we are going to see on a small intestine, we are going to see two things, right? Number one, H.E. section. What we are going to see on H.E. section, and then number two is the special staining. right so what special stain we are going to use here is the pass stain along with diastase that's all this much is enough right now right <coughs> so what we are going to see on he section he section we will see that lamina propria what i'm showing you here is the lamina propria so lamina propria of the biopsy will be showing you macrophages that's all you will not see anything beyond this on h section you will see only foamy macrophages are present throughout the lamina propria so all these are all these are foamy macrophages so these are all foamy macrophages which will be present in the lamina propria of the intestine biopsy so now we have a doubt because patient came with the malabsorption we took the biopsy of the stomach and we are seeing so many macrophages so not the next step will be the special staining what we are going to use pass what pass stains pass is usually staining both glycogen and bacteria right so now i understand so when we are applying pass stain this will become red in color right red or magenta or pink color so this red pink color substance means positive here. red pink color means it is a pass positive and what can be the pass positive it can be bacteria also and it can be glycogen also so how you will differentiate how you will differentiate because glyc now why we are using diastase because diastase has a ability to digest glucose not the bacteria so that is why bacteria will become resistance and because of diastase glycogen will be digested i understand so when you are adding diastase to the pass stain so it will digest the glycogen so glycogen will be removed and bacteria will remain so that is why we are saying pass positive diastase resistant this means bacilli is present now understand so that is what i wanted to say diastase resistant it means we are talking about bacilli is present so this biopsy examiner can show you in your exam so now you can see this is the he section and this is the pass positive and diastase jab add kiya so this will become 
resistant. So pars positive and diastase resistant. So in this biopsy, what we are seeing, this is the lamina propria, right? And can you notice there are so many foamy macrophages are present. So these are foamy macrophages which are present in the mucosal lamina propria. So this is the HE section, right? So that's what I said. Foamy macrophages will not confirm the diagnosis. How we will confirm? Confirmation is done by pass positive diastase resistant. And these are the macrophages which are filled with. So what are these things? These are all present in the macrophage only. Where in the macrophage? Within the lysosome of the macrophage. So this lysosome of macrophage will be having all the bacilli. So this is what we are going to see the pass positive diastase resistant, right? So now you understand. So all these are the macrophages. And in this macrophage, if you look at the microscopy, light microscopy to electron microscopy. So on electron microscopy, you will find lysosomes are studded with the bacilli. So that is how we will confirm the diagnosis of the Whipple's disease. Now you understand this point? Is it clear to all of you? Now look at the amoebiasis. What you will see in amoebiasis? When you will see amoebiasis, most common site we have to remember it is cecum. Cecum will be the most common site. And what will be the, uh, you know, when you will see on the low power, low power means scanner view. So you will find there is a narrow mucosal ulcer. You will notice that there is a narrow mucosal ulcer. And when you will come down, you will see there is a broad submucosal ulceration. I understand. So, so you can see the, how it is looking like. There is a narrow area like this. And then when you are coming into the submucosa, it is getting broader. So this looks like a flask shape. That is why amoebiasis, this is the exam question. Amoebiasis, what type of ulcer you will see? Flask shaped ulcers are seen in amoebiasis, right? So now you understand. So this is what we have to remember. Flask shaped ulcers are seen in amoebiasis because of antamoeba trophozoite. So anywhere in our human body, wherever you will see antamoeba, wherever you will find antamoeba, what you will notice? What we will notice? You will need, see the trophozoite will be having three findings. Number one, macrophage like appearance like this. They will be having central prominent nuclei and they will be having erythrophagocytosis. So you can see these are the erythrophagocytosis means some RBC fragment will be present inside the trophozoite because they will be damaging the uh, RBCs of the you know, blood vessel in that areas. So that is the point. Anywhere in the body, wherever, wherever you see in the central nervous system or in the liver or in a small intestine, wherever you are going to observe them, they will be macrophage like, they will be having central prominent nuclei and they will be having erythrophagocytosis. These three findings are seen, diagnosis is done. That means you are looking at the, looking at the picture of the amoebiasis, right? So that is how you have to identify an amoeba or amoebiasis, right? In the liver or in the brain or in the small intestine, everywhere it will be seen, right? Fine, so now I will show you the image, how you are going to see uh, amoebiasis. See, this is the good picture of amoebiasis, right? Same picture, as I said, same picture you will see in the CNS also, liver also and a small intestine. So right now it is a small intestine biopsy, right? So everywhere you are going to see the similar picture, right? So what I am showing you, if I am showing you this one, if I am catching up this trophozoite of antamoeba. So you can notice this is looking like a macrophage. It is not macrophage, macrophage like trophozoite, right? And what we are seeing here in this macrophage like trophozoite, central prominent nuclei, central prominent nuclei. So there is a prominent nuclei, right? Prominent nuclei. And we are also noticing there is a RBC fragments, which means erythrophagocytosis. Now you understand macrophage like organism, prominent nuclei, RBC fragment means erythrophagocytosis. That means it is a amoebiasis. That's how you are going to confirm the diagnosis of amoebiasis. Flask shape ulcer will be seen on lower, lower power, which I have not shown you. GRDS is how you are going to identify. It's again a very, very important thing. GRDS is, is usually uh, seen in immunocompromised patient. So again, I will write immunity of the patient will be decreased. So again, patient will be telling that HIV patient or diabetes patient is having chronic diarrhea for several months. 
right like that history will be given truck driver having diarrhea from past four months this was undiagnosed what will be the diagnosis right so how you will identify as you can see this is the trophozyte of the grdr which is binucleated and pear shaped you can see there are two nucleus and pear shaped but remember this is the front view right please remember this is the frontal view when you will see the side view now this will be having three kind of pattern either pear shape or comma shape or sickle shape so now understand in biopsy you will not see like this so in biopsy you will see pear shape and their their side view will be the comma shape or sickle shape this pear shape is the front view right and these are side view of the trophozoite of the grdr so now look at this this is how examiner had asked earlier in exam so now you can see this is the small intestine biopsy right and we can see all these can you notice this this one is pear shape pear shape trophozoite and these are sickle shape or you can say comma shape so what is this this is the picture of grds right so this is the picture of grds now i understand so grds is amebiasis and Whipple's disease. So that is how you will rule out on the microscopic examination. I hope you understood. So how you will identify GRDS is pear shape or comma shape. Whipple's disease, you will find a macrophage which will be pass positive diastase resistant Proferama whippelii and amoebiasis will be the trophozoites inside the uh, macrophage like trophozoites and they will be having prominent nuclei and RBC fragment means erythrophagocytosis will be present in them, right? Now coming to the next question. These are very important topic. You can get one question. This is again very frequently asked in our exam. Previous year also it came. 18 year old boy, 18 year old boy, abdominal pain and malina from past two years. His clinical and radiological examination has revealed intussusception finding. Enterotomy was done. Removing nodule, histopathology of the lesion is seen here. See the clinical finding and histopathological finding. So can you tell me what is your diagnosis? What is the diagnosis here? What will be your diagnosis? Very good, very nice. Pure Jagger syndrome, very good, very good. So that's great. So that means that you people are studying, that's keep on revising all these things. You will definitely get into the exams, right? So now you, you can see that what I'm showing you here, diagnosis is pure Jagger syndrome. So this is the pure Jagger syndrome, right? So pure Jagger syndrome, we will see what are the findings we are seeing here, right? So, pure Jagger syndrome is a basically, first I will tell you about that, then we will come to the question, right? So, basically it is a pediatric patient, right? So, who will be suffering from this polyp? Pediatric patient and they are approximate, the peak age group is 11 years, right? Pure Jagger syndrome, 11 years. Mutation will be LKB1 STK11 gene. So, what examiner asked here, what is the mutation nature, loss of function mutation or gain of function mutation? Please remember this was the, our question in 2019, loss of function mutation of the LKB1 STK11 gene is seen in Pute Jagger syndrome, right? So, P for pediatric, J for most common site is jejunum, right? And what will be the pro Presentation, they will be having polyp and because of this GI polyp, he was having intussusception, right? Intussusception was there. Intussusception means barreling, right? One narrow lumen will be coming inside like this. So, this is called intussusception, right? So, this is how in, a part of, thin part of intestine will go into the broad part of intestine. That is why, because of the polyp. And second important point you will notice clinically is mucocutaneous hyperpigmentation, where in, it is like a macule in the perioral. Usually exam will show you perioral area, but you have to keep in your clinical uh, mind that it can be perianal also in genital area also, same macule can be seen, right? So whenever you see like this, so this is the picture which I have shown you. Can you see these are the perioral or brown macules. So these are the macules, right? So these are the brown macules which we are seeing. So, perioral mucocutaneous hyperpigmentation which is shown as a macule which is quite characteristic. Similar macule you can see in the perianal areas also, right or in genital areas also. That is what I wanted to say that perianal or genital area can also have similar kind of macules, right. 
So what we are going to see on the biopsy, in the biopsy when you are going to see what I am showing you here, can you, can you notice, I will just show you, these are areas which I am marking with the green color, right. If you look at the green color which I am marking, these simple lines which I am drawing, these are actually uh, smooth muscles. These are all smooth muscles, right. So what I am marking like this, these are all smooth muscles, right. So please remember what I am saying, these are the smooth muscle, right. And where they are intersecting, so you can see that there are so many small, small lumen. What are these lumen? These are the glands. Can you see this? These these glands should be not so numerous. There should be two or three. But here you cannot count them. So what I am saying here, they are intersecting within the hyperplastic gland. So that is why I am saying hyperplastic glands. So what we will say that hyperplastic, because there is a hyperplasia. Na? So this is hyperplastic gland. So all these are hyperplastic glands. So hyperplastic glands is having intersection of smooth muscle. Now you can see that. So this looks like a, this looks like a tree, Christmas tree appearance. So this is also called as this because of this smooth muscle intersection into the hyperplastic gland. This is called as Christmas tree appearance or also called as arborizing band of smooth muscles. That is very peculiar and diagnostic finding of the pure Jagger syndrome. I understand. So this is what I have given you in this question also, right? So there is a there is a smooth muscle. Can you see that? Can you see that there are so many smooth muscles? They are going like this. Very beautiful, clear cut picture, right? Be these are all smooth muscle, and you can notice glands are hyperplastic. Many glands are there. Hyperplastic glands are intersected. So this is Christmas tree appearance. Arborization of the smooth muscles within the glands. So that is the feature of pure Jagger syndrome. So mucocutaneous pigmentation and this that will confirm the diagnosis, right? So loss of function mutation. Now if you see the option one, two, three, four. So what should be right answer? C is the right answer. Mutation in the STK11 gene. That will be the finding of pure Jagger syndrome. Can you tell me, this is the question again in our exam, loss of function mutation in P10 gene will be seen in which disorder? Can you tell me P10 gene, also called as P10 syndrome, where you will see? Yes, very good. This will be seen in Cowden syndrome, Cowden syndrome or Cowden syndrome and Banyan, Banyan rural cover syndrome. So Cowden syndrome, den is 10, that mnemonic, right? So you can remember like this also, right? 10 looks like den. So Cowden syndrome, Banyan rural cover, both are having similar spectrum of the disease. That is why sometime both together is called as P10 gene hamartomatous syndrome. A SMAD gene mutation is most common mutation in which poly most common mutation in which polyp? Juvenile polyp. So juvenile polyp is the SMAT4 gene mutation and APC gene mutation is seen in familial polyposis syndrome. Right. So that is the point we have to remember. That's all. Right. Now coming to the next question. Uh, this is again a very important MCQ. If you look at this question, a 50 year old female a 50 year old female presenting with right, right breast lump, 9 months, complaints about headache. Why she will have headache? Think about it. With nausea for past 2 months. HE section is given below, right, this pic. What is correct about this breast tumor? So can you tell me, on the basis of history, 50 year old female, breast lump is there and she is having headache and nausea. So what will be most likely diagnosis? Can you tell me the diagnosis of this cancer first? in the comment box. Yes, Pragya has given me the first correct answer. Very nice. Very good, very good. So Pragya has given me the diagnosis also. It's a lobular, invasive lobular breast cancer. Please remember what I'm saying here is invasive lobular breast cancer. This was the question in previous year exam. That is why I am talking about this. Examiner can ask you question here, right? 
invasive lobular breast cancer and what is the histological finding we are seeing here on histopathological examination what I am showing you here. Can you see the cells? Suppose I am marking these cells. Can you notice these two cells? I am just going to make it larger here. Suppose this is the cell and uh, there is a bigger vacuole within this cell like this, right, which is coming to the end and nucleus has been pushed to the periphery. So what is this cell? Can you tell me what is the name of this cell? No, Indian file is not seen here. See, examiner is cleverly not showing Indian file. Now, all are giving me correct answer. Links, Pratik, don't, don't think like that because they are the first one to give the right answer. That is why I am taking their name. Right. So, that is why I am taking their name. They are first one because majority, all are telling correct answer. If I will start taking all 500 students name, probably it will be taking very long time for me. I will not be able to take lecture. So, first who are giving me correct answer. So, everybody is equally great. Right. Nobody is lagging behind. Right. So, this is the nucleus. Right. And this is the mucin which is pushing the nucleus to the periphery. So, what is this? This is the signet ring. Please remember, in invasive lobular breast cancer, you will also see the signet ring tumor cells. That is very, very important. Signet ring tumor cells are also present in the invasive lobular breast cancer, right? And lobular breast cancer, why she is having headache? Can you tell me why she is having headache? Because they are very, very infamous for metastasis. Right, they are infamous for metastasis. Because of this metastasis, most common site is the brain and brain also it is meningeal involvement. Right, so that is why they are having. So whenever you have a breast cancer patient with the headache kind of symptom, you can think about first diagnosis as a invasive lobular carcinoma. Right, so invasive lobular carcinoma is usually multifocal. Multiple sites will be affected, and bilaterality is very common. So this is a True or false? True statement. So, always remember invasive lobular breast cancer is bilateral and multifocal. That is the correct statement. Discohesive tumor cells will be seen. Discohesive means when you will see the two tumor cells, they are not attached to each other. They are broken down and they will be like making a, this is called Indian file pattern. Right? This Indian file pattern is actually discohesive cell. Why they are discohesive? Because the cohesion is lost because of E cadherin. Cells are attached to each other by E cadherin. So, this discohesiveness is due to loss of E cadherin. Right? E cadherin has been lost. That is why there is a discohesive Indian file. So, they are following you know, one cell behind another cell like that. They are going, they are following each other like this. So, that is why it is called as Indian file or single file pattern because of loss of E. cadherin. Loss. So, discohesive tumor cells will be seen. So, now understand that is also a true statement because of, because of loss of E. cadherin. Tumor cells will have Indian file pattern. So, that Indian file pattern is also because of discohesive tumor cells. So, that is also a true statement. Over expression of E. cadherin, over expression. Can you see the language? Over expression. Will they have over expression or loss of the mutation? I understand. So, this is a false statement. There should be no over expression. There is a loss. There is a mutation. There will be a mutation, not over expression. So, this is the false statement. So, now you understand what is the question? Incorrect about this breast tumor. Incorrect. That's what I said. During exam time, you have to see the language incorrect. It means D. So, our correct answer is D, which is not a right statement, right? So, now you got this point. I will give you a, just a brief overview of the invasive lobular breast cancer. What is invasive lobular breast cancer? E. cadherin is absent. Done? So, it is mutant. So, because of E. cadherin, what will happen? Discoesive tumor cell. Now, you understand tumor cells are following each other, discoesive, and they will infiltrate the lobules. And that is how we will see Indian file pattern or single file pattern. So, because of, because of E. cadherin absence, discohesive tumor cells, we are noticing single file or Indian file pattern. Now, you understand? <coughs> and these tumor cells, how are these tumors? They are multifocal, bilateral metastasis, both breasts will be involved. And very important thing which I have shown you in this picture, they will show you signet ring cells, right? So, these are important other points about the invasive lobular carcinoma. 
right so now you can see uh, in this invasive lobular carcinoma already i have explained you these are the clear mucin and these are signet ring so that is why these are also called as signet ring carcinoma now you can see this one is the another picture of invasive lobular carcinoma which examiner had given in our exam what we are seeing here can you see they are following a line so this is you can see all are separate tumor cell all are separate tumor cell and they are forming a line so this is called as single file or indian file pattern so this is indian file or single file pattern which we are seeing in this area right now coming to the next question this can be again a <coughs> future question because uh, this uh, image was asked in this nb exam just now which has been finished so examiner can ask you this image again right so now look at this question what is this question 57 year old female presented with the breast mass gross and histopathology is given below which of the following is not true regarding this tumor very nice very good uh, rahul uh, pratap pratap nahi pratap so again pragya pragya rahul they are telling the correct answer right so that's great that's great uh, i just half an hour i think half an hour more i will be taking lecture don't worry just half an hour maximum right so many of you have given the correct answer this is not correct that this is what is this what i'm showing you this is a pud orange appearance right what is this this is the pud orange so this was the question in this uh, neat exam this pud orange appearance why there is a pud orange appearance means there is a dimpling can you see why it is called as pud orange i will i will show you here right so you can see why it is called as pud orange appearance because it it resembles like a peel of the onion right why because of the blockage of the lymph vessel so dermal lymphatics this was the right answer in this exam dermal lymphatics are blocked who is blocking tumor cells so these are blocked by tumor cells right so dermal lymphatics are blocked so because of dermal lymphatics blockade you can see here there is a there is a dimpling so dermal lymphatics is causing dimpling and breast tissue is having thickening also thick breast tissue thick or dense breast tissue so this dimpling and thickening of the breast tissue is the reason for name called as pud orange right so that this is a thick like a orange peel and they are having dimpling like you see in the orange peel so that is why it is called as pud orange appearance now you understand the so question in this uh, you know uh, and B exam was what is the PUD orange appearance reason? It is that subdermal lymphatics which has been blocked by the tumor cells, which has been blocked by the tumor cells. So that's what I am saying. You know, this is the subdermal. So it has been blocked. And when you are going to see the biopsy, when you are going to see the biopsy, what we are seeing these are the these are the lymphatics area. These are the lymphatics area. And in this lymphatic area, you are seeing the tumor emboli. You can see these are the tumor emboli in the lymphatics. So tumor emboli are present in the lymphatic. Probably these are these are the one because they are blocking the lymphatics. Na? Why there is a PUD orange? Because of the subdermal lymphatics blockade. Dermal lymphatics has been blocked. So that is what we are seeing. Dermal lymphatics has been blocked. By whom? By the tumor emboli. So this is a case of PUD orange. And where you will see the PUD orange? Because uh, this mimic like a inflammation. That is why it is mimic like inflammation. So this is called as inflammatory carcinoma of the breast so this is the diagnosis inflammatory carcinoma of the breast so this mimic like a acute mastitis so that is a correct statement this is the correct statement because it looks like inflammation right as if inflammatory cells are infiltrating the dermal lymphatics and they are causing this but actually it is a tumor cell so mimicking like a acute mastitis that is a very important thing but remember inflammatory carcinoma of the breast they contain or they have worse prognosis amongst all type of breast cancer. They will have worse prognosis, right? So this is the worse prognosis which we are going to see. So it is not having good prognosis. This is the false statement and our answer. Okay, question may kya Not true. So it is not true. It's not having good prognosis. They will have worse prognosis. Tumor cells will block dermal lymphatic. This was the question. So now you can see just now we have explained. So this is a true statement. 
राइट इट इज अ स्पेशल सब टाइप ऑफ इन्वेजिव डक्टल कार्सिनोमा यस इट इज अ स्पेशल हिस्टोलॉजिकल सब टाइप ऑफ इन्वेजिव डक्टल कार्सिनोमा सो दैट इज द इन्फ्लेमेटरी कार्सिनोमा ऑफ द ब्रेस्ट सो राइट आंसर इज बी बैड प्रोग्नोसिस विल बी देयर सो अगेन आई विल जस्ट टेल यू इन्फ्लेमेटरी कार्सिनोमा बिकॉज इट रिजेंबल्स लाइक अ एक्यूट मेस्टाइटिस इन्फ्लेमेशन वॉट हैपन्स हियर कैंसर सेल्स इन्फिल्ट्रेट डर्मल लिम्फेटिक्स लिम्फेटिक विल बी ऑब्स्ट्रक्टेड inflammation and swelling of the breast skin will be there as a result dense thickening breast skin dimpling will be present that is why it looks like a orange peel or pud orange appearance and they will have worse prognosis right so we have seen this and this was the biopsy report right so now you can see this is the dermal lymphatics dermal lymphatics this is also dermal lymphatic and within this dermal lymphatic what we are noticing these are the tumor emboli so what is this inflammatory carcinoma of the breast which will be having worse prognosis right this is a question uh, why i have framed this question for your level it may be tough but this was the question in 2020 fmj exam this is the question from the molecular classification of the breast cancer that is why i have kept this question this is the question from the molecular classification of the breast cancer which examiner had asked right so what is this molecular classification of the breast cancer so i will just explain you just i will give you the question first then i will explain you 34 year old female breast cancer done following immunohistochemistry pattern which of the following is true regarding the cancer first of all i will say that he stain is here this is the estrogen receptor progesterone receptor and her2 receptor right and whenever whenever we are applying isc what is the simple rule you have to remember either isc will be negative or isc will be positive right whenever isc will be negative how you will see on the on the histological section it will be pale blue it will be pale blue pale blue means it is negative it is not positive whenever they will be positive na they will be brown in color they will be brown in color so are you seeing any brown color in the estrogen receptor area can you tell me in the comment box is it is it brown in color in the estrogen area tell me is it brown so what i should say estrogen receptor is positive or negative positive or negative tell me no brown color na these are all pale this is also pale this is also pale so what is this estrogen receptor negative progesterone receptor negative her2 over expression negative so what is this it is a triple negative breast cancer that was the question in your exam so what is triple negative breast cancer it is a basal type and they are carrying worse prognosis so answer should be b now got this hence answer should be b triple negative is the basal cell cancer all will be negative estrogen receptor progesterone receptor her2 so as i said this is a very important thing first basic concept you have to understand that isc staining whenever we are using isc staining negative means pale blue positive means brown color so here the thing is brown color so it is all pale blue pale blue pale blue so these are all negative 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 now how you will come to the answer so you have to know this molecular classification this was the question in our exam in 2020 molecular classification of the breast cancer they are divided into five categories luminal a luminal b luminal both are luminal one and two is luminal luminal a luminal b her two fourth is basal and fourth is cloudy in low so these are the five things which we have to remember first two is luminal only luminal a and b what is common why luminal is together because they are having something common what is that common they are both estrogen receptor progesterone receptor positive and brca2 mutation will be present now understand brca2 will be present brca2 will be present so estrogen receptor positive progesterone receptor positive brca2 positive both luminal a and luminal b so what is the difference see luminal a luminal b both are both are estrogen receptor positive progesterone positive brca positive so what is the difference difference is of her2 luminal a is her2 negative and luminal b is her2 positive that is the point so always remember a is negative and b is her2 positive whenever her2 become negative it will be having good prognosis whenever her2 is positive it mean be bad positive right so that is what we have to remember in general in general there are exception which we will see right so now understand luminal a luminal b it should be erpr positive and in this question what we are seeing erpr is negative so it is not luminal a or luminal b b now understand so that is why uh, sorry so that is why i am saying that 
इट कैन नॉट बी लुमिनल ए और लुमिनल बी राइट एंड दे आर नॉट हर टू पॉजिटिव ऑल्सो सो इट इज नॉट हर टू ऑल्सो सो इट इज अ बेसल टाइप विच इज अ ट्रिपल निगेटिव ब्रेस्ट कैंसर सो नाउ यू कैन सी वॉट विल हैपन इन हर टू वेन यू विल सी हर टू हर टू विल बी ओनली पॉजिटिव एज नेम सेज हर टू मीन्स हर टू इज ओनली पॉजिटिव रेस्ट ऑफ द थिंग ई आर पी आर इज निगेटिव सो दे विल बी हैविंग बैड प्रोग्नोसिस बिकॉज हर टू इज पॉजिटिव बेसल टाइप दिस वॉज द क्वेश्चन इन अवर एग्जाम राइट सो दिस इज द पॉइंट वी हैव टू कीप इन माइंड बेसल टाइप दिस इज द पॉइंट वी हैव टू कीप इन माइंड इज ई आर पी आर हर टू ऑल निगेटिव सो दैट इज वाई वी कैन से दिस इज अ ट्रिपल निगेटिव ब्रेस्ट कैंसर and triple negative basal cell carcinoma is a brca1 positive that was the question in our exam and they will have worse prognosis so now you understand so triple negative basal barca1 positive they will have worse prognosis cloudin low is just like a basal only thing is cloudin is deficient which is a marker of intercellular addition right so they will have a decreased expression of the e cadherin and they are also er pr her2 is negative so molecular level cloudin is same like that but they will be having poorer prognosis worse will be with a basal cell so now you understand what i have shown you here luminal a luminal b her2 basal cloudin worse prognosis is for basal what is basal basal means base base means all will be negative right her2 er pr everything is negative so triple negative breast cancer barca positive worse prognosis will be there right so that is the point you understood this point so that is the thing you have to remember so now you understand this point so that is why i said this question is little tough but molecular classification which i have shown you you must revise you are going to get one question from here this is again a question which came in our previous year exam 13 year uh, 15 year old boy difficulty in coordination of the movements abdominal pain hemolytic anemia and hepatitis on further examination i has revealed brown ring in the cornea you can see the brown ring in the cornea is very clearly visible so now you can diagnose this what is your diagnosis simple question there is no need to write anything it's a simple question when you find uh, you know if ophthal posting you have done if you have remember uh, you can easily solve this question multiple time repeats question so this is a wilson disease that's all right wilson disease it's not alzheimer disease it's not hemochromatosis they will not show this and what we are seeing here what is this kf ring very nice kf ring which we can see also like this and the best thing is to examine them under the slit lamp best seen by slit lamp kf ring is present where kf ring will be present in the cornea where in the cornea decimate membrane right so that is the point we have to remember so this is the wilson disease so few important things which i wanted to discuss here in the uh, wilson disease Uh, these are the questions which came in exam they are autosomal recessive disorder and chromosome is 13 long arm please remember 13 long arm is affected in the wilson disease so what is important in the uh, 13 long arm 13 long arm actually they encode for a gene they encode for a gene called as atp7b gene right so what atp7b remember simple word this was also question in our exam atp7 gene 7b gene mutation is in wilson disease so they encode for the enzyme called uh, carrier protein called as ceruloplasmin right and what ceruloplasmin will do this will combine with copper and then they will cause biliary excretion right so simple this is the normal atp7b gene which you should remember right so this is the normal atp7b gene so normally when they are present ceruloplasmin will be encoded by them so they will combine with copper and biliary excretion will be there but what is happening here they are having mutation because of mutation what will happen there is a decrease in the ceruloplasmin level because of decrease ceruloplasmin decrease combination with the copper with the ceruloplasmin and that will decrease the biliary excretion also so when all these things is happening so what is getting accumulated copper so increase copper accumulation where in the liver so that is why he is having hepatitis liver problem and in the rbc so liver disorder and hemolytic anemia when these two things you find in a patient please remember liver disorder and hemolytic anemia whenever you have to find in your in your clinical life you must rule out wilson disease that is how it is a clinical dictum it is a clinical dictum whenever you see a hepatitis case with the rbc anemia you should rule out first disorder as a wilson disease that's what you have to remember and this is all because of copper accumulation 
right now this wilson disease will be usually affecting pediatric age group 6 to 20 years what are the organs mainly they will be affecting liver brain and eyes so in this question i have shown you i with the kaiser fleischer ring where in the decimate membrane which is a yellow brown ring but they will also have a sunflower cataract liver they will have all spectrum of hepatitis remember all spectrum this is a very important mcq all spectrum of hepatitis means acute chronic fulminant everything will be present so all spectrum of hepatitis is seen in wilson disease right what necrosis what cirrhosis macronodular cirrhosis and mallory denk bodies will be seen right which is a eosinophilic hyaline inclusions made up of intermediate filament which is called as cytokeratin 8 and 18 right so mallory denk bodies are eosinophilic hyaline material which is made up of intermediate filament cytokeratin 8 and 18 these are all important mcq which came in our earlier exam what is mallory denk bodies these are eosinophilic intermediate filament right made up of cytokeratin 8 and 18 so that are the important thing we have to remember right what you will see in the brain brain will be having basal ganglia damage Putamen will be having atrophy and cavity because of putamen atrophy and cavity they will be having hepatolenticular degeneration this name has been given to them hepatolenticular degeneration because basal ganglia is getting damaged and in basal ganglia putamen is getting atrophy see because of the basal ganglia damage this patient is having high risk of parkinson disease so please remember whenever parkinson patient is coming to the clinical opds so sometime neurological uh, expert will be asking for ceruloplasmin level now you understand you can correlate because this Parkinson can be previously Wilson disease in his childhood. That is why you have to check the ceruloplasmin. So now you understand. So whenever examiner says uh, Parkinson patient was checked for the ceruloplasmin, what is the earlier suspect in this patient? So it's a it's a Wilson disease, right? So now you understand this point. How you will diagnose? Most specific finding is increased urinary copper excretion. Gold standard is liver biopsy. And what is the liver biopsy finding? Copper will be more than 200 microgram per gram of the liver tissue. And which special stain we will use? That is the point we have to remember. Rhodamine stain and rhodamine stain, red brown will be color of copper. Right? So, these are the three things for diagnosis. What is this? Number one is the urinary examination. Number two is liver biopsy copper accumulation. Number three is the special staining on the tissue of the liver which you have taken out. Right? So, red brown color. So, you, you can see this is the rhodomine stain. Right? Examiner can ask you this question because these are the stain given in the textbook also. So, these brown color thing is the copper. Right? So, this brown color thing is the copper which we are seeing in aromine rhodomine stain. Right? So, this is the Wilson disease. Coming to the next question. Uh, this is again a very important question from the HBV serology. Right, examiner will ask you. So, I am just giving you a simple question which came just now in this NEET PG also. 29 year old boy, uh, lady, serology uh, was showing you HBSAG positive, IgM HBC positive, IgG HBS and HBE and anti HCV or negative. So, what is your diagnosis? Very simple question. Very, very simple question. HBSAG positive. IgM HBS, HBC is positive. See, I will give you a hint. This is not the exact hint. Exact hint is the IgM HBC positive. When you find this, that means it is a diagnostic find, right? So, whenever you find IgM HBC positive, it means it is a sign of acute hepatitis B infection because all things are negative. So, it is a simple answer, acute HBV infection. So, here I will, I will tell you uh, some important point. For HBV serology, you have to remember antigens and antibodies, right? So, there are three important antigen, HBS antigen, HBC antigen or HBE antigen, right? HBS antigen, HBC antigen, HBE antigen. So, HBS antigen, these are all important MCQ. They are earliest marker, epidemiological marker. These are the questions. Earliest marker of hepatitis B on serology is HBS antigen earliest epidemiological marker is hbs antigen and hbs is for both acute and chronic so that is why i said we cannot say hbs antigen is seen in chronic only it can be seen in acute when they are present when examiner says it is more than six months then we can say it is a chronic but what is the most important marker for the acute infection 
एक्यूट इन्फेक्शन मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट मार्कर इज एंटी एच बी सी इम्यूनोग्लोबलिन एंड वेन यू फाइन आई जी एम दिस इज द अर्लीएस्ट मार्कर ऑफ एक्यूट इन्फेक्शन सो प्लीज रिमेंबर देर आर टू लैंग्वेजेस आई एम यूजिंग कैन यू कैन यू नोटिस टू लैंग्वेजेस अर्लीएस्ट मार्कर इज एच बी एस एंटीजन अर्लीएस्ट मार्कर ऑफ एक्यूट इन्फेक्शन डिड यू नोटिस वट आई एम सींग अर्लीएस्ट मार्कर ऑफ एक्यूट इन्फेक्शन इज आई जी एम एंटीबॉडी अगेंस्ट एंटी एच बी सी एंटीजन right now you understand and when you uh, when you find igm antibody this is also marker for window period so earliest marker why it is a good marker because in window period also you can identify the virus igg if it is present it means either it is a previous infection or ongoing infection when you find antibody against the hbs antigen that means this patient is protected because of active and passive immunization so whenever you find anti hbs antigen antibody against hbs antigen it means he has been immunized He is protected, right? When you find anti-HBC antibody, IgM antibody is the window period earliest marker of acute infection. IgG antibody means previously he was infected or still chronicity of infection is going on. HBC antigen will be never detected because it will be inactivated in our serum. So what we will see HBE antigen. HBE antigen is a marker of viral replication, which is a viral load marker, and that means it is a high infective, highly infective, right? so whenever viral replication is there means viral load is more if viral is replicating means more virus is there if more virus is there means more infection will be there so whenever hbe antigen is positive means viral is replic virus is replicating more virus more infection more things will be there right and whenever we see a uh, antibody against hbe it means it is a non infective because antibody has been formed so this is a period of zero conversion now i understand whenever anti hbe is formed it is a period of zero conversion so this is the marker of zero conversion hbc antigen has been converted into the hbe antibodies it means it is a zero conversion means he is getting improved he is getting non infective zero conversion is there right viral replication there are two marker qualitative and quantitative qualitative marker is hbe antigen and quantitative this is important hbv dna and hbv dna polymerase but best one is hbv dna for quantitative marker so these are the viral replication marker i i my gut feeling says that you will get one question from here in your exam so please please remember this you will get in your exam resolution i cannot uh, improve the resolution beyond beyond this the pdf will be given you can revise right now you can see next question is 40 year old female again this is a very very important question 40 year old female presented with slowly growing thyroid swelling from the past 11 months histopathological examination was done microscopic finding is given patient is suffering from which of the following condition very simple question very nice so many of you are giving right answer that is the papillary carcinoma of thyroid so this is the papillary carcinoma of thyroid why you are saying papillary carcinoma can you see the nucleus all these nuclei which i am showing you these are optically clear nuclei optically clear nuclei so optically clear nuclei is looking like a orphan any eye appearance right which was our question in our exam orphan any eye appearance so when you find this nuclear finding orphan any eye appearance or optically clear nuclei this is diagnosed as a papillary carcinoma of thyroid right so please remember this is the papillary carcinoma of thyroid which we are seeing here right so it is a papillary carcinoma of thyroid follicular carcinoma of thyroid uh, you will be having invasion right which which is not given in our exam because it's a very difficult case right even for the histopathologist it's very difficult so invasion of the blood vessel or capsule will be seen that time you will say follicular carcinoma anaplastic carcinoma will be having anaplastic means bizarre cells will be there right medullary carcinoma can you tell me how you will identify medullary carcinoma how you will identify medullary carcinoma tell me how you will identify medullary carcinoma what you are going to see in medullary carcinoma you will see amyloid stroma right can you tell me one question i am asking you one question and give me the answer in comment box quickly which thyroid cancer can be diagnosed only by the nuclear features only nuclear feature can diagnose yes 
medullary carcinoma you can use calcitonin also as a marker so that is true calcitonin is a tumor marker that is true so this papillary carcinoma of thyroid where nuclear feature is diagnostic so i am just going to explain you see nuclear features are diagnostic in which cancer papillary carcinoma of thyroid so papillary carcinoma of thyroid nuclear features are diagnostic what we are going to see orphan any eye appearance so why it is called as orphan any see normally nucleus will be having chromatin right stippling of chromatin will be present in the normal nucleus right that is what we are going to see right that is what we are going to see in orphan any eye appearance so optically clear nucleus will be clear so you see there is no nuclear chromatin so that is what it is a clear nuclei because there is no chromatin here no chromatin is present so that is why optically clear nuclei which is called as orphan any eye appearance this is number one thing you can also notice there is a line so this is called nuclear grooving this is also very diagnostic finding of the papillary carcinoma of thyroid and third one is pseudo inclusion why pseudo inclusion because now you can see eosinophilic cytoplasm has come here so cytoplasm has come or dragged or included in nuclei that is why it is called as pseudo inclusion they are not true inclusion like a cmv right it's a cytoplasm which has been come inside the nucleus so these are pseudo inclusion so remember three nuclear findings which are diagnostic of papillary carcinoma of thyroid orphan any eye appearance nuclear grooving pseudo inclusion so can you see here orphan any eye appearance which is the optically clear nucleus nuclear grooving there is a ridge or lining pseudo inclusion cytoplasm is coming inside the nucleus and giving a pseudo inclusion so when you find these three things that will confirm samoma bodies are not diagnostic please remember samoma bodies are not diagnostic that is why i am not writing samoma body will be seen here but they are not diagnostic right so now you can see that samoma bodies are seen here samoma bodies these are dense calcium that will be seen but what is very important fibrovascular core this is the vascular core that is why it is called as papillary because papilla is made up of fibrovascular core so please remember that this fibrovascular core is the reason for the name called papillary so that is why it is papillary and on these papilla you can see the tumor cells are formed so you can see tumor cells are formed and when you will see the tumor cells you can see optically clear nuclei which resembles like a this lady the cartoon lady or fun any any that any you have you would have read in the you know that uh, uh, the comics in childhood we used to study right so these are orphan any eye appearance which is optically clear nuclei samoma bodies are seen and when you are seeing cytology you can see there is a nuclear grooving can you see there is a line there is a line nuclear grooving and you can notice cytoplasm has come inside in this cell so this is the pseudo inclusion so these are the three findings so what are these three optically clear nuclei nuclear grooving and pseudo inclusion so when you find these three things you can diagnose papillary carcinoma of thyroid that's what we have to remember right so now you can see how you will identify see why i wanted to show you this medullary carcinoma of thyroid this medullary carcinoma of thyroid is very important because examiner had asked this question amyloid stroma will be present right you can see this is the amyloid stroma this is eosinophilic blue blue mark right these are all amyloid stroma acellular amorphous pink material these are all amyloid so we are seeing amyloid stroma right and these are the collection of the polygonal tumor cells so that is not very important what is very important to focus on these amyloid stroma which i am marking with the blue color amyloid stroma so right what examiner can do he will show you this picture along with this picture and he will write okay this is the congo red staining i can see that congo red staining and these are apple green by refringence can you notice all these are apple green by refringences so now you can notice polarized light apple green by refringence so it is amyloid so whenever apple green by refringence with thyroid tumor now understand thyroid tumor apple green by refringence that means it is a it is a medullary carcinoma of thyroid right now understand so it means it is a medullary carcinoma of thyroid and medullary carcinoma of thyroid how you will diagnose by using a tumor calcitonin this is the tumor marker for medullary carcinoma of thyroid so that is also one important mcq right
Right. So now I am going to show you another good question which came in our exam. A 40 year old female. What I am showing you here. A 40 year old female presented with swelling around the knee joint. See knee joint 40 year old female. Right. And knee x-ray was showing you soap bubble appearance. Soap bubble appearance is there. Right. Soap bubble appearance because of the lighting. Why soap bubble? There may be lysis of the bone and biopsy was taken. And this is the biopsy finding. On biopsy finding what you are observing? I will mark areas. I will mark areas for you. Can you see all these areas? And look at the other areas also. Right. So, which of the following is most likely diagnosis? So, what will be most likely diagnosis here? Very nice. Many students, they got it. So, bubble means giant cell. Very good. Very nice. Very nice. Osteoclastoma. Very good. So, answer is D. This is the giant cell tumor which is also known as osteoclastoma. Why not it is a TB? Because see in this uh, swelling around the joint, age group, this kind of the x-ray examination on the knee joint, this is not fitting in the TB. right? But what we are seeing, we are seeing so many multinucleated giant cell. I want to ask you one question. What is this multinucleated giant cell? Is it a tumor? Is it a tumor? Tumor cell? Or it is a simple giant cell, osteoclastic giant cell. Yes, this is the osteoclast, not tumor cell. Please remember, these are non-tumor cells. These are the osteoclastic cells. So, remember this, this multinucleated giant cell is not a tumor cell. These mononuclear cells, please remember this mononuclear cells are the tumor cells. That is the very, very important thing which you must understand. Because so many, you, you know, so many giant cells are there. So, you can identify giant cell tumor or osteoclastoma. Right, the name osteoclastoma is a misnomer because it is not the it is not the uh, tumor cells. Uh, no, tumor cells are mononuclear tumor cells. Right, so I will discuss all these things. I will I will explain all these other finding also along with this giant cell explanation. So listen to me very carefully. What are the important point? As I said, giant cell tumor is a osteoclastoma. Right, what is this tumor? This is a benign tumor. But remember. Even though it is benign, but it is a locally destructive. That is why we are seeing so bubble appearance, lysis of the bone. So, benign but locally aggressive. Right. What will be the most common site? Most common site is the femur and where? Distal site. So, distal site of the femur and mostly they are epiphyseal tumor. Right. So, distal femur, epiphyseal tumor and who will be commonly affected? Females in the 20 to 50 years. So, you can see in the history also 40 year old female right around the knee joint means it will be approximately distal part of the uh, you know uh, femur which will be the epiphysis right so distal part of the femur or epiphysis will be affected right so that is the point we have to remember what will be the findings on on examination you will see x-ray examination is showing expensile lytic lesions which is the reason for soap bubble expensile because that lysis is going on they are expanding i understand i will show you the image also expensile lytic lesion like this can you see this expensile lytic lesions are there right so now you can see that x-ray examination is showing you expensile lytic lesion right so these are expensile lytic lesions that is why it is called as soap bubble appearance this is the finding on x-ray examination which i have given you in the question right and when you are going to see the gross examination right when you will see the gross examination you will see the red brown mass why there is a red brown mass because of the areas of hemorrhages areas of hemorrhages are there can you see this red brown mass is there and can you notice there are so many small small area you can you can easily correlate that is the reason for the expensile lytic or soap bubble appearance so you can see here also soap bubble appearance like things are seen so now when we will take the biopsy from these area what we will see in giant cell tumor there are two component tumor cells are uniform mononuclear cell can you see all these are uniform mononuclear cell so these are tumor cells can you notice these are the tumor cells so these are mononuclear tumor cells tumor cells are mononuclear and the multinucleated osteoclastic cells which we are seeing is not the tumor cell they are non tumor cell so that is the crux of the giant cell tumor diagnosis this is a monoclonal tumor cell and x-ray examination so bubble appearance and what i have shown you they are commonly seen in the epiphysis of the femur, distal part of the femur, females are affected, right? So, that is the giant cell tumor. Now, coming to the uh, uh, osteosarcoma, how you will identify osteosarcoma? This is again a very important MCQ. 
So first of all, you should remember that this is the malignant mesenchymal tumor of the bone. Why? Because it is a forming bone matrix. So these mesenchymal tumor cell will form the bone matrix and remember this bone matrix will be haphazard. That is why sometime it will be looking like a fungal hyphae. So sometime when you uh, examiner will be saying that fungal hyphae like irregular bone matrix is formed. So mostly it is a osteosarcoma. Right. Who will be affected? Male. Here <laughs> you have to be very cautious. It can be a young patient also. It can be an elderly patient also. Please remember, it can be young patient who will be less than 20 years, elderly patient who can be beyond 50 years. So, both age group can be affected. So, that is why bimodal, right? And most common site which examiner asked, distal part of the femur. But remember, distal part of the femur was osteoclastoma also. But here, it will be metaphysis. There, it was epiphysis. Now, you understand? So, metaphysial tumor. What you will see on my on gross examination, gross examination is just a finding. You can see tumor cells are infiltrating and causing damage of the cortex. Can you see? This is the clear cut normal cortex. And here tumor cells are just damaging cortex and they are raising the cortex. And because of this, can you notice there is a, there is a triangle formation. Right. So, what I am saying you tumor cells infiltration damaging cortex lifting the periosteum lifting the periosteum and then it is giving a triangular area which is called as codman triangle right codman triangle or sunburst appearance same thing you are seeing on x-ray examination can you see there is a periosteal lifting and codman triangle has been formed so this is the x-ray examination of the codman triangle Right, so this gross finding and this finding was given in exam. So that is why I am showing you along with this picture. So gross finding, this picture, can you see the bone? How is the bony trabeculae? These are all irregular bony trabeculae, right? They are not normal finger, right? Those you can see fine lace like pattern or sometime examiner will also explain this as a fungal hyphae like, like bone or bony trabeculae. So, that will be the finding of osteosarcoma. So, that is how you will confirm the osteosarcoma. What will be the finding on the uh, Ewing sarcoma? Ewing sarcoma is the malignant bone tumor, right? It is a malignant bone tumor and it came in our exam many times in last three years. Where, see this Ewing sarcoma, previously they thought it is a bone tumor. But now they are aspect, finding that they are having primitive round cell without any differentiation. So now Ewing sarcoma along with primitive neuroectodermal tumor. So sometimes some of the authority they think it is a primitive neuroectodermal tumor. So now this is the new name given to them. ESFT means Ewing sarcoma family tumor. And sometimes they are also called as neuroendocrine tumor. So please remember they are also considered as a neuroendocrine tumor. Right. So in this what is this most commonly it is a pediatric age group male less than 20 years. Femur is the most common site here also, but again it is a diaphyseal tumor. This tumor who is seen in pediatric age group involving the femur diaphysis, they will be having painful bone along with systemic complications like a fever, high ESR, anemia, TLCs. So, this is a systemic feature. So, whenever you find a bone tumor with pain, remember bone tumor plus pain plus systemic feature right so you should think about Ewing sarcoma that is what i have wanted to say that in history right from the history you have to understand and what will be the finding onion skin appearance will be present on the radiological examination why because of the periosteal reactions layers of reactive bones will be formed right and how you will confirm so you will confirm this by fish so now you can see fish is used here also because this will help us to find out the translocation 1122, which will be forming EWS FL1. If you remember, it is fine. If you don't remember, that's okay. So, they will be finding, finding the abnormal cell proliferation. So, this translocation 1122 will confirm the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma. This is the question which came in exam. 1122, it's not 922, right? Right? So, it is very, very important thing which we have to remember, right? So, now you can see. What I am showing you, there are two areas. 
if you look at this area what i'm showing you here is the lytic area right this is the lytic area which i'm showing you lytic area can you see this is the lytic area right and now i am showing you in this area can you notice there is a very faint white color is coming so there are so many layers are there so this area is showing you onion peel appearance because of the periosteal reaction there is a onion peel appearance which is we are seeing in this erring sarcoma right and when you will take the biopsy from this you will find a characteristic small round blue cell tumor can you notice number one thing so many small round blue cell tumor so i am just writing a small round blue cell tumor a small round blue cell tumor is present right so this is the small round blue cell tumor and what i am observing here can you see this this is the central area where we are seeing some some you know undifferentiated cells are there we don't know what is this that is why undifferentiated primitive neuroectodermal tumor and around this you can see the tumor cells are there what is this rosette or pseudo rosette so this is a beautiful pseudo rosette pseudo rosette because there is something if there is nothing if it is empty area it will be true rosette it's a pseudo rosette and this pseudo rosette is called as homer right pseudo rosette so that is the very very important thing we have to remember homer right pseudo rosettes are seen in the ewing sarcoma so two things we are observing one is the small round blue cell tumor and second is the homer right pseudo rosette homer right pseudo rosette so that is the important thing why there is a empty area why this is the empty area this area is clear or empty because of presence of glycogen glycogen is present that is why this is the tumor which will be pass positive tumor so now understand pediatric age group painful bone along with systemic features pass positive bone tumor pass positive glycogen containing bone tumor one diagnosis in your mind having sarcoma that's all translocation will be 11 22 that is how you are going to confirm so now understand all these things come to the next question this is again a very important just few more questions just one or two more questions are there so just keep patience high yes homer right will be also seen in neuroblastoma and medulloblastoma you are absolutely correct you are absolutely correct manish you are absolutely correct four year old child testicular mass right biopsy was done biopsy is given here so what will be the tumor marker in this patient so this is again a your a previous year question i have just modified this very nice very nice very good this is a yolk sac tumor very beautiful you have given me the diagnosis that is the best part right it means your preparation is going in right direction right you should not worry see these these four five days which is remaining for your exam now you need not to worry about anything you have read well i am seeing the responses i am getting is the extremely beautiful response right these are not easy questions right so you are giving extremely good response this is the yolk sac tumor which is a non seminomatous tumor right why i am saying yolk sac tumor i will tell you because in this i will explain you why i am saying this is the yolk sac tumor number one history if you look at the history four year old male child right it can be female also if the ovarian mass right but we are talking about male child testicular mass right so male child testicular mass so mostly we will think about because yolk sac tumor is the is the most common malignant testicular tumor in it is a malignant tumor right that is why i am writing most common malignant tumor in less than 5 year old child or you can say in the pediatric age group which is less than 5 year old pediatric age group that is the most commonly that is why we are seeing and after seeing this uh, you know biopsy i am damn sure it is a yolk sac why i am saying because whenever see this i will explain you whenever you find a lumen in the center this is the lumen and lumen is having rbc so whenever lumen is having rbc that means it is a blood vessel clear i will explain you again just i am explaining you right just i am giving you a rough explanation there is a rbc right and this is a blood vessel and blood vessel is covered by all these are tumor cells so blood vessel is covered by tumor cells so blood vessel is covered by tumor cell now understand again what we are seeing this is a empty area so this is a actually a cystic area that's all 
so tumor cells are surrounded by cystic area and when you will see the cystic area there is again cystic area is covered by tumor cell cystic area is again covered by cystic area is again covered by tumor cell so this appearance is called as schiller what is the name schiller dual bodies some of the student they are also calling this as a glomerulite body absolutely correct glomeruloid bodies so glomeruloid bodies are schiller dual bodies they are seen in yolk sac tumor right so these are the finding of the yolk sac tumor so see what i have explained you i'm just giving you brief see there is a central blood vessel which is covered by covered by tumor cells covered by tumor cells again they are enclosed in a cystic space and they are covered by tumor cells so this is the schiller dual bodies which you see in the this one right so now you can see i have explained you this picture so this is the central blood vessel again i will write here again i will write here this is the blood vessel right covered by tumor cell cystic space covered by tumor cell so what is this this is the schiller dual bodies schiller dual bodies which is seen in the yolk sac tumor and what is the what is the marker now the question is what is the tumor marker so there are two tumor markers which you all should remember because you remember only alpha fetoprotein but examiner will ask you i'll tell you in this exam examiner will ask you this name which is called as alpha 1 antitrypsin alpha 1 antitrypsin is a very favorite question of examiner for the yolk sac tumor so they are also positive so there are two tumor marker alpha fetoprotein alpha 1 antitrypsin right so now i am coming with the question alpha fetoprotein is the right answer right where you will see vanillyl mandelic acid can you tell me vanillyl mandelic acid previous year question right so alpha alpha fetoprotein will be seen in the yolk sac tumor right and always remember alpha 1 antitrypsin will be also seen in the yolk sac tumor vanillyl mandelic acid will be seen in very nice pheochromocytoma this will be seen in pheochromocytoma or it can be also seen in neuroblastoma both cases right pheochromocytoma neuroblastoma both will be having vanillin calcitonin just now we have finished where tell me calcitonin where you will see calcitonin very good calcitonin where you will see calcitonin calcitonin will be seen in very nice it is seen in medullary carcinoma of thyroid and what about 5 hia this is a very important potential question which came in exam 2019 5-HIAA, 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid. <coughs> very good, very good. Rupesh, Faz, carcinoid, carcinoid will be having 5-HIAA. So that is how you have to remember, right? So now I will just sum it up. Calcitonin is seen in medullary carcinoma of thyroid. Beta HCG is seen in choriocarcinoma and seminoma also. Please remember, beta HCG is also present in seminoma because. beta hcg is secreted by which cell this is also our question syncytiotrophoblastic cell syncytiotrophoblastic cells are going to secrete the beta hcg right so this point we have to remember right beta hcg is secreted by the syncytiotrophoblastic cell and 5% or 15% of seminoma they are arising from the syncytiotrophoblastic cell that is why beta hcg will be marked right 5 hydroxy indole acetic acid as i have told you carcinoid vanillyl mandelic acid is for both neuroblastoma and pheochromocytoma right so that's done coming to the next question this is a very very important question again i am telling you this was our previous year question in fmg exam this came in our this neat pg exam and this will come in your 4th june exam also a patient presented with a fever headache vomiting and neck rigidity that's all diagnosis done csf sample so meningitis diagnosis done men csf sample was analyzed and now you can see the csf sample here it's a very very classical question by seeing this picture itself you should not think about anything that there is a mild decrease in the glucose increase protein level and coagulum is seen that's all right decrease in the glucose increase in the protein coagulum is there so what is your diagnosis tell me <laughs> very good so many of you are giving the correct answer very good so whenever you find coagulum na whenever you find coagulum or clot 
दिस इज कॉल्ड एज कॉब वेब कोएगुलम कॉब वेब कोएगुलम इज बिकॉज ऑफ बिकॉज ऑफ फिब्रेन प्लीज रिमेंबर समटाइम एग्जामिनर विल नॉट से दैट कोएगुलम एग्जामिनर विल सिंपली राइट फिब्रिन इज प्रेजेंट इन द सी एस एफ ऑफ विच ऑफ दी पेशेंट सो रिमेंबर इट इज अ टी बी मेन इन जाइटिस दैट सॉल सो दिस इज अ केस ऑफ टी बी मेन इन जाइटिस सी वॉट आई एम राइटिंग हियर डिक्रीज इन द ग्लूकोज इंक्रीज इन द प्रोटीन लेवल डिक्रीज इन द ग्लूकोज एंड इंक्रीज इन द प्रोटीन दिस विल बी सीन इन बैक्टीरियल मेन इन जाइटिस ऑल्सो राइट एंड दिस विल बी सीन इन टी बी मेन इन जाइटिस ऑल्सो so that is why many students have given answer as a meningococcal or pyogenic so it's not meningococcal pyogenic it is a tb meningitis why i am saying why i am saying tb meningitis because there is a one catch point that is what you have to look for in your exam examiner is saying coagulum and he is showing you coagulum in this picture can you notice i am showing you coagulum in this area so that is cob web coagulum which will be seen in tb meningitis so why we are thinking tb meningitis because of the fibrin forming the spider web like structure in the csf that's what uh, we do in our uh, our lab also whenever we see the csf now sometime by seeing the sample itself we will give the diagnosis yes this is the done clots are there coagulum is there so it is a tb meningitis what you will see in the viral meningitis that was the previous year question see viruses now they are always on the dieting they don't eat anything so glucose they will not take so what i mean to say that in viral meningitis when you will see the glucose level will be normal right and protein level will be elevated so that is the another important thing you have to remember glucose normal protein level elevated this was the previous year question and it will be finding of viral meningitis but pyogenic meningitis tb meningitis both will be having decrease in the level of glucose now you understand bacterial meningitis tb meningitis both is having decrease in the glucose level but viruses are on dieting they will not eat the glucose right they are always on the dieting right so that is why glucose will be normal protein will be elevated so that is how you are going to diagnose this one i have given uh, this csf finding you can see later on i will just uh, write down some important point when you will see the gross csf pressure cells protein glucose chloride right so just i am just writing so whenever you find cob web coagulum as i have given in this question this is because of fibrin so that means it is a tb meningitis viral meningitis see there are two parameters which you have to focus one is protein second is glucose these are the two most important ask parameters so when you find protein level is high and markedly decreased level of the glucose that means it is a bacterial or pyogenic meningitis when you find the protein level is elevated glucose is decreased not markedly it is mild decrease so that means it is a tb meningitis and especially when examiner is showing you fibrin or cob web coagulum it's a tb meningitis viral meningitis uh, csf uh, specimen will be clear like a normal and their protein level will be elevated glucose level will be normal which was a previous year question so now you can see this is the csf examination coming to the next question a patient came with ulcerated nodule this was again our question in previous year exam ulcerated nodule on the tip of nose measuring 0.7 cm hp lesion is given histopathological hp means histopathological examination is given right and tell me what will be your most likely diagnosis here i am telling you in this discussion i can promise you you are going to get one or two question minimum in your upcoming exam so give me the diagnosis history itself is giving patient nodule on the nose that's all and this kind of picture very nice very good see why i am not going to take them some students are writing palisading also that's the great fantabulous it means you you know you have read it very thoroughly right so why it is called palisading can you see these are the areas if you see this is the basal area and in this basal area if i will show cells are like this they are having parallel arrangement this parallel arrangement of the cells please remember when there is a parallel arrangement of cells present this is called as palisading appearance and whenever you see palisading appearance is a nose area in a skin biopsy it means undoubtedly it is a basal cell carcinoma most common is skin malignancy right so now your answer is basal cell carcinoma so bullous pemphigoid will be having so many tense blisters not like this history will be not like ulcerated nodule 
they will be having tense blister and on biopsy there will be a sub epidermal blister there is no sub epidermal blister you are seeing the mass this is the tumor mass and basal cells are having palisading so whenever you find palisading in the basal cell that will be called as basal cell carcinoma right squamous cell carcinoma they will be having keratin pearls so remember that eosinophilic uh, structure will be like this like a pearl so keratin pearls will be there in a squamous cell carcinoma pemphigus vulgaris they will be having broken blisters and they will be having supra basal blisters on the histological examination i will show you all these things supra basal blister so that is the important thing now the discussion which i am going to do is very very important see this is the picture which examiner had asked in recent exam also can you see these are the three pictures nasal area face where sun exposure is more uv lights are coming pyrimidine dimers are getting formed you remember zero derma pigmentosa so uv light is coming pyrimidine dimer is getting formed and they are going to cause the cancer how will be the appearance can you see there are so many dilated tortuous thin dilated tortuous blood vessels are there so this is called telangiectasia right so we will say that telangiectasia or telangiectatic mass is there so when you will see the larger view of this mass many dilated area will be there and you may find central ulceration also along with this you may find central ulceration also if you look at the appearance this is pearly white or pearly papule so sometime examiner will write pearly papule showing telangiectasia and central ulceration or central necrosis that is quite suggestive of the basal cell carcinoma when it is at the nose or in the area of the face from the angle of the mouth to the lateral canthus of the eye like this in this area in this triangle when you see tumor like this pearly papule telangiectasia central ulceration and biopsy is showing you the palisading so you can see the tumor cells are tumor cells are having parallel arrangement so this parallel arrangement at the basal area is called as palisading right arranged radially with their long axis in the parallel alignment this is called as palisading and this is seen in basal cell carcinoma that is how you will diagnose basal cell carcinoma right can you tell me in the uh, comment box what is the another name of basal cell carcinoma which came in our exam previous year what is the name what is the name of this basal cell carcinoma basal cell carcinoma is also known as also known as rodent ulcer please remember this ulcer is not ulcer this ulcer is not ulcer this is not ulcer this is malignancy this is the tumor cancer right and another important thing even though it is a malignant tumor but there is no metastasis these are the two important questions which you have to remember for basal cell carcinoma also known as rodent ulcer even though they are malignancy usually what we say that malignancies are you know famous for spread or metastasis but here there will be no metastasis here there will be no metastasis right now coming to the this picture can you notice this is the tumor cell right and you can see in this tumor cells what we are observing right what we are observing there is a concentric hyper eosinophilic lamellations so this is eosinophilic concentric lamination this lamination is the keratin pearl so whenever you find keratin pearl in the ulcer area so this keratin pearl it's not only skin tumor anywhere lung cancer stomach cancer anywhere if you find eosinophilic concentric area it means it is a squamous cell carcinoma so squamous cell carcinoma will be having keratin pearl that was the question which examiner had asked earlier in exam so keratin pearl is suggestive of Keratin pearl is suggestive of squamous cell carcinoma. Yes, squamous cell carcinoma can be seen anywhere on the face. It can be seen on anywhere on the skin, not on the face, skin anywhere. Right? Coming to the uh, pemphigus. What is pemphigus? Pemphigus is a life threatening autoimmune blistering disorder. Blister will be there, and this is autoimmune disorder. Very, very important point autoimmune blistering disorder. It is an autoimmune disorder, and they will form the blister. Why? Because autoantibodies, which autoantibodies? IgG type of autoantibodies. What they will do? They will dissolve the intercellular. See, two cells are attached. 
now this will be broken down so there is a broken down this is called acantholysis this is called acantholysis and acantholysis is seen in pemphigus it is not seen in bullous pemphigoid it is characteristic of pemphigus right so within epidermis and mucosal epithelium there is a dissolution now cells are detached so acantholysis is there so this is acantholysis 30 to 60 years of the age group what is happening antibody is igg again in pemphigus pathogenesis igg antibodies are formed against which antigen what are those uh, addition molecule desmoglein 1 and 3 both please remember sometime examiner ask you which desmoglein desmoglein 1 and 3 both desmoglein 1 and 3 both will be damaged so they will damage the intercellular addition and this will form the bulla or blister correct so desmoglein 1 and 3 both will be damaged by them so now you can see what will happen in pemphigus vulgaris can you see this empty area is the blister this empty area is the blister and can you notice these cells are the basal cells how are the basal cell arrangement can you tell me can you see this area of the graveyard and can you can you compare this basal cell which are which are also looking like that which are also looking like that row of tombstone right so row of tombstone appearance that is very diagnostic finding tombstone like basal cells and above the basal cell blisters are there so what is this blister supra basal blister above the basal layer na? so these are these are the basal cells and above the basal cell you are seeing the empty blister so this is the supra basal blister so we will always say that pemphigus vulgaris blister will be supra basal above the basal layer and how is the basal layer row of tombstone like appearance that will confirm the diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris right and how we will confirm this we can also use the immunofluorescence staining so in this immunofluorescence staining what we are seeing you can see uh, all these are all these are areas these are the cell membrane cell membrane is positive for igg immunostaining so this is called as reticular pattern or fish net appearance so this is the direct immunofluorescence please remember direct immunofluorescence fish net or reticular pattern will diagnose the pemphigus vulgaris so now you understand these are the findings supra basal blisters supra basal blisters basal cells are having row of tombstone appearance along with along with reticular or fish net immunofluorescence is diagnostic of pemphigus vulgaris right now look at the bullous pemphigoid this is bullous pemphigoid what you are going to see in the bullous pemphigoid bullous pemphigoid it is again uh, autoimmune disorder but here antibodies are formed against hemidesmosome protein so they are formed against hemidesmo protein and what are the hemidesmosome protein they are also called as bpag bullous pemphigoid antigen right hemidesmosome what is hemidesmosome they will attach epidermal cell suppose this is the epidermal cell right and they are going to get attached to the basement membrane so this attachment is given by the hemidesmosome so this is the hemidesmosomes understand so epidermal cells are getting attached to the basement membrane by by the hemidesmosomes and what are these protein bpag1 bpag2 c the blister which you see in bullous pemphigoid is not because of BPAG1. Blister is only, only associated with BPAG2, can be a future MCQ also. It is a line of Robbins, right? So, blistering is because of BPAG2, right? So, how you will see this? On examination, you will see the tense bulla which is filled with the clear fluid and on microscopic examination, you will find sub-epidermal non acantholysis you remember pemphigus vulgaris it was having acantholysis you remember pemphigus just remember i have told you now that acantholysis will be seen in the pemphigus it is not seen in the bullous pemphigoid so that is why it is written like this an examiner asked in your derma also right non acantholytic non acantholytic blister will be present in the bullous pemphigoid so here because of the hemidesmosome has been damaged so entire entire epidermis will separate from the underlying dermis and they will be having lymphocyte and eosinophilic inflammation and they will be having blister can you see these are the tense large blister over the scene and intact epithelium is present when you will take the biopsy 
now you can see this is the blister right and this is the epidermis so blister is below the epidermis so what we will call this this is not suprabasal this is the sub epidermal blister because this is the area of the dermis right so that is why we are calling this as a sub epidermal blister so sub epidermal blister and what they are containing can you see that eosinophilic cells and lymphocytic inflammation is there so that will be diagnostic of bullous pemphigoid so that is how bullous pemphigoid will be given diagnosis so in this what we will see that on immunofluorescence microscopy again direct immunofluorescence now you can see this is the linear dermoepidermal junction because that was dermoepidermal junction right see that dermis has been separated from the epidermis so dermoepidermal junction has gone so what we are seeing the linear ribbon candy immunofluorescence will be seen so ribbon candy in this name because it looks like a ribbon right so that is why examiner will be using the name ribbon candy immunofluorescence is seen in bullus pemphigoid right now this is the last question of the session last question few important thing we will discuss quickly 45 year old female diabetic chronic iucd user complained of fever and chills biopsy from the endometrium is given here what is most likely diagnosis this is again again i am telling you all these are your previous year questions so you can expect these question in your exam i can assure you many question you are going to see in your exam from these discussion which we have done today so yes uh, many of you are giving me right answer this is a question of this is a question of actinomycosis and remember actinomycosis can be because of the uh, bacteria also and can be because of fungus also this was the question in this neat exam so that is why i am saying bacteria and fungus both can cause right so right now i am i am showing you what will be the finding why i am saying it is actinomycosis remember the main catch point in this question whenever examiner says that there is a chronic iucd iucd intrauterine contraceptive device right so whenever examiner says that there is a history of copper tea or something and when you see a picture like this how is this picture can you can you see this how is this picture you can see there is a cotton ball appearance so what i will say that that two things you have to remember that's all cotton ball like structure and in this cotton ball like structure what you are seeing there is a sun ray like can you see this sun ray like radiations are there in the peripheral area so cotton ball appearance with sun ray like radiating filaments sun ray like radiating filaments whenever you find this means it is a actinomycosis this means it is a actinomycosis and which is very common in iucd whenever you see intrauterine contraceptive device is used by a patient you will mostly see the actinomycosis right so in yes fungal mycosis, all these things will be seen so now you can see cotton ball and sun ray it will be seen on both histology and cytology so on histology means tissue biopsy and cytology also you will see the same finding only thing you are seeing so many neutrophilic abscess here cytology it will be not showing that much of abscess right so that's all you have to diagnose actinomycosis by the this features now i will i will explain all these things why these are not right one by one first actinomycosis which is the right answer for this question as i said associated with intrauterine device like a copper tea what will be the presentation as you have seen in this patient pelvic pain vaginal discharge this will be the so patient will be because it's a lower part so definitely they will be having pain and vaginal discharge and how you will identify you can see there is a cotton ball like appearance can you notice cotton ball like appearance and radiating filaments are there cotton ball like structure and sun ray like radiating filaments so whenever you find this kind of finding that means it is a diagnostic of actinomycosis right so now you can see this is the histopathological examination i had already I have described so i'm just writing for the sake of understanding when you will be having this pdf right so these are the actinomycosis right now you can see the same actinomycosis this is the cytology right and now you can see same thing same thing don't worry see this is the cotton ball and sun ray like i will write here cotton ball appearance and these are sun ray like radiating filaments radiating filaments right so that is how you will identify actinomyces right now how you will identify gardenella 
दिस वॉज द क्वेश्चन विच केम इन अवर एग्जाम सो मैनी टाइम्स गार्डेरेला इज एसोसिएटेड विद बैक्टीरियल वैजिनोसिस राइट एंड वॉट विल बी द सेल विच विल बी डायग्नोसिक क्लू सेल्स राइट सो दैट इज द क्वेश्चन गार्डेनेला और बैक्टीरियल वैजिनोसिस क्लू सेल्स आर डायग्नोस्टिक फाइंडिंग वाइट इज कॉल्ड एज क्लू सेल बिकॉज वेन यू विल सी द पैप्समियर सी दिस इज द पैप्समियर साइटोलॉजी पैप्समियर आई विल शो यू द ओरिजिनल पिक्चर फर्स्ट अंडरस्टैंड दिस वेन यू आर गोइंग टू सी द पैप्समियर दीज आर दी नॉर्मल स्कॉमर्स सेल्स राइट नाउ लुक एट दिस स्कॉमर्स सेल हियर यू कैन सी द बॉर्डर यू कैन सी द एजेस आर वेरी क्लियर बट हियर यू कैन नॉट सी एजेस बिकॉज ऑफ द बैक्टीरियल कॉलोनीज सो दीज आर बेसोफिलिक स्टिपलिंग राइट दो दीज बेसोफिलिक स्टिपलिंग इज बैक्टीरियल कॉलोनीज नॉट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस बेसोफिलिक स्टिपलिंग इज द बैक्टीरियल कॉलोनीज ऑन ऑन साइटोलॉजी नो बैक्टीरियल कॉलोनीज विल बी लुकिंग लाइक अ बेसोफिलिक स्टिपलिंग एंड दे आर कवरिंग और हाइडिंग द एजेस ऑफ स्कॉमस एपिथिलियम सो दिस इज द हिंट this is the clue that is why it is called as clue cells now understand why it is called as clue cells because basophilic staining is covering the squamous epithelium and they are not allowing to see their edges right so now you can see here in this picture you can see here you can see the edges but in these two squamous epithelium can you notice all these are basophilic stippling so what is this bacterial colonies so whenever you are seeing basophilic stippling these are bacterial colonies so bacterial colonies are hiding the edges you cannot see the edges right so they are hiding the edges of squamous cells so that is why these are also known as clue cells which you will see in the bacterial vaginosis caused by gardenella right so this is the bacterial vaginosis caused by gardenella right so we cannot see epithelial cell why because bacterial colonies are bacterial colonies are see basophilic bacterial colonies are hiding the edges so we cannot see the beautiful edges we are seeing here we cannot notice that is why these are clue and these clue cells are clue for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis caused by gardenella right now how you will identify trichomonas see this can be a future question because this came in our option but not answer so trichomonas vaginalis is the sexually transmitted disease this question came in exam because whenever you see a female patient who is affected by this you have to treat the male partner also that was the question examiner usually asked because if female is suffering from the disorder male will also get the disorder because of the sexual because it is a sexually transmitted disease right so both partners should be treated simultaneously in which infection trichomonas vaginalis not in the gardenella that gardenella bacterial vaginosis is not std disorder trichomonas vaginalis is a std disorder so these are flagellated protozoans and how it will be maybe asymptomatic maybe with the frothy vaginal discharge and how we will identify trichomonas they will be pear shaped organism you can see this is the pear shaped organism and they will be having elongated nuclei so pear shaped organism elongated nuclei that will confirm the trichomonas vaginalis now you can see this is the patient right this is the patient who came and in this you can notice these are the pear shape organism right these are the pear shape organism this is the another pear shape organism and in this nucleus you can see it is elongated right so now you understand what i am showing you trichomonas vaginalis pear shaped organism and how will be the nucleus elongated nucleus pear shaped organism elongated nucleus trichomonas vaginalis that is how you will diagnose trichomonas vaginalis right how you will identify molluscum because many of you have given molluscum molluscum is also a sexually transmitted disease there are two pox virus these are pox virus disease type 1 type 2 so type 2 only is associated with or most commonly not only most commonly associated with sexually transmitted disease skin or mucosa will be affected 6 week is the incubation period what you will notice that on clinical examination there will be pearly papule dome shaped why pearly papule dome shaped why there is a dome shape because there is a central necrosis so because of necrosis when you will see they are having central dimpling so dome shape pearly papular lesion with central dimpling or umbilication these are the findings right these are the findings which you are going to see in the 
mollusca right so now you can see this is the this is the exact clinical picture which examiner had asked in our exam 3 years back right see this is the pearly papule right in this pearly papule can you notice the central area is little bit going inside because of the central necrosis this central necrosis is the reason for umbilication or dimpling now you understand so central necrosis is the reason for umbilication and dimpling this is a very characteristic skin flesh like lesion central dimpling suggestive of molluscum contagious right so typical flesh color dome shape or umbilicate pearly lesion molluscum how you will see on the biopsy see why there is a dimpling now you can see on the biopsy on microscopic examination see can central dimpling will be showing you a cup like imagination cup like imagination on microscopic because there is a necrosis so they are going down so in that area when you will come down into the epidermis you will see the eosinophilic ellipsoid bodies which are called as henderson peterson bodies which is seen in molluscum contagiosum right so this is how uh, you are going to see uh, molluscum contagiosum biopsy this is how it is going to look can you see what i have told you that there is a cup like imagination can you notice this is the cup like imagination which is corresponding to the central necrotic area right corresponding to the central necrotic area and when you are coming down into the epidermis what you can see these are eosinophilic ellipsoid henderson peterson body right eosinophilic ellipsoid viral inclusions in simple word right viral inclusions and these eosinophilic ellipsoid viral inclusion is called as henderson peterson body right henderson peterson bodies which will be seen in molluscum contagiosum so that is how you have to diagnose this right that is how you have to diagnose this right so these are all important points so that's all you uh, you can uh, follow me at my youtube also and you can see me in my uh, telegram group also so here i would like to tell you few more points because exams are near many students were asking about that thing see now uh, you just need one thing in your mind just you have to stay motivated that is very very important stay motivated don't give up at this moment because why i'm saying the last moment we think that i have not read or i'm not able to recall so don't think about that thing if you're not able to recall just forget about it why i'm saying because it is just an anxiety please try to understand it is anxiety which is preventing you to recall because you are thinking i have to recall everything but remember when you will go to the examination hall you will be able to recall each and everything beautifully and very very precisely in your exam so that is why i am saying you just need to have a patience keep revising last 2 years please remember latest 2 years of your fmg question bank that's all see the question answer question answer if you are not able to find explanation then you read the explanation that's all quickly you revise whatever notes you have been preparing from here in the classroom you keep on revising go through don't look back don't analyze don't try to recall don't do all this mistake this is a mistake now right don't do all this thing keep reading keep revising have a proper night sleep of 7 to 8 hours don't read in the night very late try to sleep by 11 o'clock and have a 6 to 7 hour of the sleep that will be the best thing for your preparation right and just go to the exam with a fresh mind with a positive mind and remember you have done so much of hard work this is not going to be get wasted it is never go into the waste definitely you are going to crack this exam and definitely you are going to shine in your life so my best wishes to all of you and thank you so much for giving so much of patience and my best wishes and i i pray to the god that you all will be coming up with a very great marks and full success not only in this exam in your life also thank you so much my best wishes to all of you bye bye yeah ajay sir ajay sir hello to everyone and uh, just uh, na happy to announce that sir has made you na get all possible topics clear sir ne patho bhi kara di derma bhi kara di surgery kara di so i think if this session you watch at high speed also just before the exam it will cover up almost all important things so i just request you do watch the session and uh, mine and sir you know we all want to see you give you your best
and all we are doing is just from one point of view that is you should get all your question correct in the exam and this is the most you know most fulfilling uh, session of patho i can say taken by any faculty 5 ghante mein sarne chat pure 50 ghante ki patho ka bhi hai so even i was watching thoda mera hi medicine ka aur improve karne ke liye but i really really happy that uh, sir gave his time so really mai nahi dekha sir sir is great sir is great is appreciating i am thankful thank you sir we uh, have a long relationship we i know him for a long time i'm very happy that we are working together again <laughs> you are earlier in same issue <laughs> that other issue so okay so the best of luck okay and please ask all your friends who watch the session and after exam do bless nlc with your results your comments and your juniors also so they will be you know kept with the best possible academic environment best faculties like devesh sir ye thoda mai bada lunga good to see yes really happy you all okay. chalo so we will say bye bye take care milte hain aap logo se theek hai and Chai. be under the guidance of sir yes. you know sir will guide you best you know remember all these things right so sir will guide you and you will excel definitely getting kitna mentors like dr devesh would be a real boon for you okay sir ka ye spirituality bhi bahut hai kabhi ye bhi baithoge sir will give you kitna uh, lots of kitna spiritual knowledge also chalo take care bye bye theek hai na thank you bye bye